from the National Assembly in Moscow, come to beg the great nun, Martha, to allow her son to take his rightful place as the next Tsar of Russia. Michael Romanov is the only one who hadn't stained his good name during the time of troubles. He was their only hope. If he refused, anarchy would return. Russia, they said, could not endure such grief again. Theodore, son of Ivan the Terrible, died childless. He was the last of the Rurik dynasty, rulers of Russia for more than 700 years. His younger brother, Dmitri, had died seven years earlier in suspicious circumstances. The National Assembly elected Boris Godunov as the next Tsar, but a rival soon emerged, an imposter claiming to be the last Tsar's dead younger brother. This so-called false Dmitri seized the throne and married the Polish noblewoman, Marina Mniszek. Within a year, the false Dmitri was slain in a palace coup and Marina fled Moscow. In exile, she recognized a second false Dmitri as her husband and bore him a son, Ivan. Russia was leaderless and Sweden and Poland took advantage of her weakness, attacking on two fronts. Russia lost Karelia, Novgorod, and Smolensk. Amid the anarchy and devastation, only 10% of Russian lands were still being farmed. Famine and fear stalked the land. Without a strong legitimate ruler, it seemed the Russian state would soon cease to exist. Towards the end of the brutal winter of 1613, delegates of the country's National Assembly traveled to Moscow, where they would decide the fate of the motherland. The Zemsky Sabor, or National Assembly, was Russia's parliament of the 16th and 17th centuries, brought together to advise on the most important political issues. In 1613, the assembly had about 1,000 delegates drawn from the nobility, clergy, merchants, and free townsmen. The decisive vote was held on March 3rd. After lengthy debate, the 16-year-old Michael Romanov was elected Tsar. Michael's father was Fyodor Nikitich Romanov, cousin of Tsar Fyodor, the son of Ivan the Terrible. This gave him a strong claim to the throne. When Boris Godunov took the throne, he saw Michael's father as a potential threat and forced him to become a monk under the name of Filaret. Michael's mother, Zenia, became a nun, taking the name Martha. Filaret rose to the rank of bishop, but was imprisoned by the Poles while on a diplomatic mission. His Polish captors didn't bother to inform him that his son had been made Tsar of Russia. The people of Moscow, meanwhile, were informed of the National Assembly's decision through public announcements in Red Square. Michael Fyodorovich Romanov, it was declared, was the new sovereign of the Grand Duchy of Muscovy and Tsar of all the Russias. Michael had grown up amid the 15-year anarchy known as the Time of Troubles. When he was just four, he was taken from his parents and sent to the country. Later, his mother came to take Michael back and together they went to live a quiet life in the Apatyev Monastery, 200 miles northeast of Moscow.
hoarse and exhausted ambassadors, bearing the holy icon of Our Lady of St. Fyodor, spent hours persuading the Romanovs to accept power. Finally, they consented. After many years of lawlessness and violence, a new Tsar ascended to the Russian throne. Michael Fyodorovich Romanov, founder of the Romanov dynasty. By God's will, Tsar and ruler of all Russia. The coronation of Tsar Michael I was held on July 22nd, 1613. Chapter 1, Michael I Fyodorovich. There was no going back for Michael Romanov. He ascended the steps of the Cathedral of the Assumption, the son of a noble, and descended them as Tsar. The state he was to rule was on the verge of collapse, so the young Tsar followed his intuition and ruled not as an autocrat, but in consultation with his advisors. On his initiative, the National Assembly, which had formerly met once every few years, began to meet more regularly to offer him advice. Despite the expectations of many, Michael didn't become a puppet of the noble factions at court. He remained his own man, biding his time. When one Dutch visitor suggested that Michael should take firm measures against his enemies, he answered, don't you know that our Russian bears never hunt in the first year of life? They only hunt when they are older. Michael faced three rival claimants to the throne. To the north, the Swedish King Karl Philip. To the west, the Polish Prince Vladislav and in the south, the three-year-old Ivan, son of Marina Manishek and the second false Dmitri. The boy's claim was upheld by 3,000 Cossacks, led by the adventurer Ivan Zarutsky. But their followers soon deserted their cause, and he and the boy were handed over to the Tsar's soldiers and brought to Moscow to meet their fate. The executions took place in front of a huge crowd by the city's Serpukov gate. The Dutch traveler Elias Herpman remembered it for the rest of his life. Zaruski was impaled on a stake. Then Dmitri's son was brought out. A snowstorm was blowing, wet snow slapping the boy on the face. He kept asking, where are you taking me? Those carrying the child kept him calm and brought him, like a lamb to the slaughter, to the gallows. The poor boy was hanged as a thief. The Tsar's enemies could have used the boy to foment civil war, casting Russia back into the time of troubles. Michael would take any measure, no matter how brutal, to prevent that. Anarchy had been avoided but war seemed inescapable. Swedish troops were besieging Peskov, 360 miles west of Moscow. Michael ordered his diplomats to negotiate peace at any price. In 1617, the Treaty of Stalbov was signed, and the city of Novgorod and surrounding lands were returned to Russia. The next threat was a Polish army advancing on Moscow, led by Prince Vladislav in person. The Poles reached the walls of the Kremlin itself, the citadel at the heart of the city. Russian spies learned that the Poles were digging a mine under the Arbat Gate, but the Tsar ignored the pleas of his advisors and refused to abandon the city. Weighing on his mind was not just the fate of the city, but a personal dilemma. 
Poles still held his father prisoner. Michael knew if he left Moscow, he would lose the throne. If he lost the throne, he would never see his father again. On December 1st, 1618, Poland and Russia signed the Truce of Diulina. The region from Vyazma to Chernigov was returned, but many issues remained unresolved. Smolensk remained under Polish control, and Prince Vladislav refused to renounce his claim to the Russian throne. But Russia was exhausted by war. It desperately needed peace, a breathing space, and time to rebuild. However, the treaty was a personal triumph for Michael. Under its terms, all prisoners taken during the time of troubles were to be returned. Amongst them, his father. It was nine years since their separation. Michael had always looked up to his father and tried to emulate him. Now, he was finally to be reunited with this legendary figure, the Metropolitan Bishop Filaret. The father could see that his son had become a real Tsar of Russia, God's chosen ruler. Ten days later, the Tsar made his father Patriarch of Moscow, the head of the Russian Orthodox Church. From henceforth, they would rule together as father and son. The influence of the Tsar's mother, the once all-powerful great nun Martha, began to wane. She no longer had any say in affairs of state and had less and less access to her son. The Tsar was now in his 20s, a grown man. Accordingly, it was announced that by God's will, the great ruler, Tsar Michael, had reached the age of adulthood, and the time had come for him to take a wife. The Tsar's mother had found a bride for her son, but Michael made his own decision. Years ago, during his exile, he had fallen in love with Masha Klopova, the daughter of one of his guardians, and promised to marry only her. The Tsar's decision was announced, and his bride-to-be was found rooms within the palace. The Solchikov brothers, relatives of the Tsar's mother, were put in charge of her safety. But just before the wedding, Masha suddenly fell dangerously ill. The palace was alive with rumor and suspicion. The Solchikovs summoned the best foreign doctors, who announced that a terrible disease was devouring the royal bride from within and no cure was possible. People were soon whispering that the Tsar's mother was behind it because she was opposed to the marriage. In any event, Masha eventually recovered, only to be exiled to Siberia for apparently concealing an illness from the Tsar's advisors. An investigation later concluded she'd been poisoned by the Saltikovs, who were dismissed from court. But the whole affair put Michael off any thought of marriage for many years. When Tsar Michael turned 28, his relatives began to worry. Without an heir, the future of the dynasty was in doubt. Once more, his mother had a candidate. This time, reluctantly, Michael agreed to the match and was married to Princess Maria Dalkarukova. But four months later, Maria fell sick and died, the cause never fully established. After this latest disaster, Michael dismissed his mother from any involvement in his marital affairs and instead arranged for the traditional election of a Russian royal bride. The advice he received was to watch the girls carefully from afar, appraising their age, complexion, eyes and hair look for signs of injury or illness, and ensure she's healthy in mind and kind by nature. The tradition of electing a Tsar's bride was essentially a beauty contest, involving thousands of candidates from noble families. First, royal officials sorted applicants on the basis of their height, size of head, 
and size of feet. Then senior nobles and court doctors inspected the girls in the capital. Finally, 10 to 20 of the most beautiful girls were brought to the court, where they were introduced to the Tsar in person. When Michael announced his decision, his advisors were speechless. He chose Evdokiya Streshneva as his queen. She hadn't even been in the contest. She was the maid of one of the candidates and the daughter of a poor nobleman. From bitter experience, the Tsar decided to handle all the arrangements himself. The identity of his bride was kept a closely guarded secret, and she was brought to the palace just three days before the wedding. Tsaritsa Evdokiya, the Russian Cinderella, proved to be kind, considerate, and loving. She bore Michael 10 children, though only four survived infancy, three daughters and a son, Alexei. It was enough to ensure the dynasty would live on. Michael and the land were at peace for a short while. Michael was determined to reclaim Russian lands lost during the time of troubles. It would mean war with Poland. First, he reorganized the army, introducing new weapons and equipment based on developments in Europe. In particular, Michael learned from the Swedish army, the strongest in Europe. New regiments were formed with eight companies of 200 men. Each had 120 musketeers and 80 pikemen. New muskets were bought, which weighed four kilograms instead of six, so they could be fired without a support. By 1632, 10 new regiments had been formed, with a strength of 17,000 men. It was one thing to create a new army. It was another to teach it how to win on the battlefield. Russian forces were defeated outside Smolensk, and after two years of war, both sides sought a settlement. The 1634 Treaty of Polyanovka brought no territorial gains for Russia apart from the town of Sierpiesk, ceded by the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth. Russia also paid an indemnity of 20,000 rubles, in exchange for which King Vladislav of Poland renounced his claim to the Russian throne. <laughs> Russia itself was gradually becoming a more prosperous society. Thanks to Michael's efforts, English and Dutch specialists came to Russia to share their expertise. They lived in the foreign districts of the big cities, such as Moscow's famous German Quarter, and invested capital in local enterprises. Russians referred to the Germans, or often any foreigner, as Niemets, from the Russian word Niemoy, meaning mute because they couldn't speak Russian. In the 10th year of his reign, Tsar Michael invited English geologists to investigate iron and copper ore deposits in the Ural Mountains. Eight years later, the first state steelmaking plant was opened in the region. Twelve years after that, a Dutch entrepreneur built an armory at Tula, 100 miles south of Moscow, that's still in operation today. Russia soon began to export arms to some of the most developed countries in Europe. The average wage at this time was three kopecks a day for which one could buy three chickens, or 45 eggs, or one and a half kilos of salmon. A sheepskin coat cost 50 kopecks, or about two weeks' wages. A pair of boots was 10 days' wages, while a cow cost two rubles, or about two months' wages. Abroad, the Russian state was gaining greater influence. 
In 1625, Shah Abbas, the ruler of Persia, sought to win favor by sending the Patriarch of Russia a holy robe. This sacred relic was believed to be the one worn by Christ before his crucifixion, later taken by one of the Roman soldiers present. Patriarch Philaret, the Tsar's father, ordained a week's fasting to mark its arrival before presenting the holy robe to the sick. 67 people were said to have been miraculously cured in the first six months alone. The robe itself was later placed in a cathedral within the Kremlin. Today, a part of the robe can be seen in the Cathedral of Christ the Savior in Moscow. After the barbarism of the Time of Troubles, the Romanovs sought to nurture a cultural revival within Russia. One of Patriarch Filaret's first decrees was to restore the Tsar's once vast library, now largely destroyed. Scholars were sent to search for books in distant monasteries and to make copies of rare manuscripts and return with them to Moscow. Just 30 years after the Time of Troubles, Russia was back to the level of prosperity she'd enjoyed before the state had slid into anarchy. Trade and productivity were on the rise. People had enough to eat and felt safe. It was an age of economic and political stability. Tsar Michael had achieved the impossible and brought the Russian state back from the brink. On July 12, 1645, the Tsar celebrated his 49th birthday. That morning after church, Michael seemed to have a presentiment of his own approaching death. He publicly forgave all those who had ever insulted or sinned against him and ordered a general amnesty for all prisoners. On coming home, the first Romanov Tsar of Russia said goodbye to his wife and son and died peacefully later that day. Russia mourned its much-loved ruler for three days. Many thousands from all ranks and walks of life came to pay their respects before his coffin. Services were held in his honor in all the churches of the land. Alexei Mikhailovich, Michael's eldest son and heir, was as young as his father had been when he ascended to the throne. But the country he inherited had been utterly transformed. Famine, civil war, and destruction no longer stalked the land. Russia was now stable and prosperous. The new ruler of this reinvigorated state, Tsar Alexei, was handsome, intelligent, virile, and devout. Ahead lay great victories and bloody revolts remarkable achievements and fatal mistakes. Alexei Mikhailovich was destined to become one of Russia's most controversial rulers. Chapter two, Alexei I Mikhailovich. The young Tsar was not overawed by his new responsibility. It was a role he'd prepared for since early childhood. His education had begun at the age of six. After learning the alphabet, he was taught to read using stories from the Bible. The prince's household included 20 stewards, six teachers and 18 musicians, as well as bodyguards, acrobats and jesters. When Alexei was seven, he was given a set of miniature weapons, an arquebus, 
bow and arrows, swords, armor made in Germany, and musical instruments, maps, and engravings from Western Europe. Alexei's chief tutor was a nobleman named Boris Marazov. He encouraged his pupil to broaden his outlook and introduced him to Western culture. Many Europeans were invited to the Tsar's court, including interpreters, diplomats, and scholars. Alexei's personal doctor, an Englishman named Samuel Collins, admired his patient greatly. The emperor is handsome and strongly built. He has fair hair and doesn't shave his beard. He is tall with noble bearing. He can be cruel when angry, but he is mostly kind and gentle. He has an excellent memory and is devout. One could name him among the most kind and wise rulers. But for the cloud of advisers and noblemen who surround him and turn his good intentions to evil. During the first years of his reign, Alexei pursued many passions. Much of his time was spent visiting remote monasteries to perform acts of worship. He also collected rare and exotic birds, kept an elk farm and experimented with new agricultural techniques. He tried to grow melons, almonds, cotton and grapes. But without doubt, his greatest love was hunting with his falcons. The Tsar owned no fewer than 3,000 falcons, each of which, it was said, he knew by name. His household included 100 falconers of varied rank, paid between 6 and 60 rubles a year, not including bonuses. All were members of the Department of Secret Affairs, which handled the Tsar's amusements and private business. The head falconer, Afanasy Machushkin, was Alexei's close friend. The upkeep of the mews and hunting stables cost the treasury 75,000 rubles a year, the equivalent of about $10 million today. On the road, the Tsar's hunting party was more than half a mile long. First came 300 stewards mounted on richly decorated horses, three abreast. They were followed by 300 guardsmen in crimson caftans, five abreast. Then 500 armored cavalry, three abreast. Next came 40 parade horses in ornately decorated harnesses, followed by the reserve carriage horses, and finally the Tsar himself in his English carriage, accompanied by courtiers and hangers-on, no more than a few dozen. Young Alexei was enjoying himself in a manner worthy of a Tsar. He left affairs of state to his tutor, Boris Marazov. The nobles, jealous of Marozov's influence, urged the Tsar to marry, since a married man had no need of a tutor. But Marozov was not to be so easily outmaneuvered. When the Tsar expressed his desire to marry, the greatest beauties were brought to him from across Russia. He picked his favorite, but when she was brought to him a second time in court clothes, Marozov instructed the servant to tie her headscarf so tightly that the girl quickly fainted. It was declared that the girl had fainting sickness. To conceal this from the Tsar was a crime. Her father was exiled to Siberia, and her family fell from favor. Marozov, an elderly widower, then asked the Tsar to help him pick his own bride and introduced him to the Miroslavsky sisters. Alexei fell in love with the eldest sister, Maria, and married her, while Marozov married Anna, young enough to be his granddaughter, so strengthening further his ties to Alexei. Alexei's family life proved a source of great joy to him. Maria was five years his senior, but she proved a perfect match and ideal Saritza. They lived together for 20 years and had 13 children. The Tsar's gentle manners earned him the nickname, the most quiet. 
but his reign itself would prove anything but. The clouds of war and revolt were gathering. On June 1, 1648, Alexei and his court were returning to Moscow from the Trinity San Sergius Monastery. When the procession reached the city gates, they found the way blocked by a huge crowd. The people of the city had come to present a petition to the Tsar, complaining of the excesses of his bureaucrats. But the Tsar refused to speak to them. His guards drove them away and arrested the ringleaders. The next day, the Tsar was returning from another monastery when he was again met by a huge crowd. They pushed his guards aside, broke through to the Tsar's coach and seized control of the horses. The 19-year-old Alexei was face to face with his subjects for the first time. Despite being surrounded by an angry mob, he remained calm. He listened to their complaints and promised to stamp out government corruption and to dismiss all bribe takers and embezzlers from office. Top of their list was the Tsar's old tutor, Boris Mazarov. In the course of two years, Marazov had amassed a huge personal fortune and made himself the second richest person in Russia. As chief treasurer of the state, he reduced spending by slashing the wages of all bureaucrats, forcing many to accept bribes simply to survive. He appointed friends and allies to offices of state, but only after they paid him an enormous bribe. But Marazov's most dangerous policy had been to raise the tax on salt. Salt was the universal food preservative. When its price rose fourfold, everyone was affected, and the poorest were threatened with starvation. The events that followed were reported in all the courts of Europe. One account was left by a Dutch traveler to Russia, thought to be a spy. A crowd of people forced their way into the palace courtyard. The guards sided with the people and burst into Marasov's house. They trampled everything underfoot, threw his belongings from the windows and ransacked the place, taking all they could. They shouted furiously, this is our blood. Marasov himself escaped into one of his majesty's chambers and hid there. There were revolts across Russia, from Ustyog and Salvichigodsk in the north to Kursk in the south. The Tsar was under siege in his own palace. The pregnant Tsaritsa nearly miscarried. She gave birth five months later, but their first child died within the year. To appease the people, the Tsar ordered the execution of many corrupt officials, but not Marazov. Alexei would not sacrifice his beloved tutor and instead exiled him to a monastery 300 miles north of Moscow. In response to the salt riots, the National Assembly was urgently convened within the Kremlin. It advised the Tsar that only a comprehensive new legal code could restore order. A special commission was established in which the Tsar himself took an active role. The result was the Saborny Ulogenia, a legal code that sought to consolidate all the state's existing laws into a single document for the first time. It would prove a cornerstone of Russian law for centuries to come. The code's 25 chapters and nearly 1,000 articles were copied and glued together into a single roll 309 meters long. After its approval, 1,200 copies were printed and one sent to every major city. The code entrenched the privileges of the nobility, who became the only people legally allowed to own serfs. The status of these peasants was made permanent and hereditary. The Saborny Ulogenia was in force for almost 200 years, from 1649 until 1832. When the rioting finally abated, Boris Marazov quietly returned from exile. But his place as Alexei's closest advisor had been taken by another. 43-year-old abbot of Novospassky Monastery, Nikon. Nikon made a great impression on the devout Tsar. Soon he was ordained Metropolitan Bishop of Novgorod. 
Three years later, Alexei appointed him patriarch, head of the entire Russian Orthodox Church. With the Tsar's backing, the new patriarch began a large-scale reform of the Russian Church. Nikon believed that over the last four centuries, the rituals and beliefs of his native church had become riddled with corruption and abuse, and were increasingly at odds with the rites performed by the Greek Orthodox Church. The morality and conduct of Russian priests and monks had also been called into question. Nikon's reforms were intended to bring the Russian church back into line with its own early practices and those of the Greek Orthodox Church. Russians were now to cross themselves using three fingers and not two. They were told how many times to bow during services, what musical instruments could be played in church, and how to correctly spell the name Jesus Christ. For a deeply conservative church, such reforms were no small matter. They led to sharp divisions within the church. So-called old believers denounced them as heresy and continued to practice the old forms of worship in secret. But ultimately, it was their leader, Archpriest Avakum, who would be burnt as a heretic. Nikon's support grew steadily, until by the end of Alexei's reign, his cause had become impossible to resist. Die-hard opponents remained, but many more embraced the practical benefits of his reforms, such as restoring discipline among the clergy and promoting education. Tsar Alexei had supported Nikon's reforms, but the patriarch began to overreach himself becoming involved in every aspect of government, from politics to diplomacy and the conduct of military campaigns. Meanwhile, the Patriarch's enemies at court spread rumors to undermine him. Relations between the head of the church and the head of state reached a new low when Tsar Alexei failed to attend the Patriarch's service at the Cathedral of the Assumption. It could mean only one thing. Patriarch Nikon had fallen from favor and could no longer count on the Tsar's support. Nikon left for the New Jerusalem Monastery, a day's journey from Moscow, where he planned to await the Tsar's apology. But it never came. Instead, the Tsar appointed a new patriarch. In 1666, a great synod was held in Moscow, attended by the most senior priests of the Greek and Russian Orthodox Church. The synod dismissed Patriarch Nikon from his post, but at the same time excommunicated his great adversary, Archpriest Avakum, and upheld Nikon's entire program of church reform. Marazov and now Nikon were gone. Tsar Alexei, this passionate youth, lover of falconry, loving husband and father, would now rule alone for the first time. Little did he know he was about to face one of the most turbulent periods in all of Russian history. The first threat would come from the south and the Cossack renegade Stepan Razin. Razin was a Cossack chief or Ataman from the Don region. He had a long record of insurrection and banditry along the Volga River and around the Caspian Sea. But in 1670, he aimed at nothing less than the creation of a new free state for the Cossacks. After he seized the towns of Zaritsyn and Cherkask, thousands rallied to his cause. Government troops were eventually able to stamp out the rebellion, and Razin was betrayed to the authorities by his Cossack rivals. He was brought to Moscow and executed. Even while he struggled with church reform and Cossack rebellion, Tsar Alexei faced war against the old enemy, Poland. Since the time of troubles, the Commonwealth of Poland and Lithuania had occupied former Russian lands, including the important city of Smolensk. But while the Tsar was away with the army, the dreaded news arrived that plague had broken out in Moscow. 
The Tsar's family and court were hurriedly evacuated to the monastery of Trinity Lavra of St. Sergius, and the capital was quarantined. By the 1670s, Moscow was one of the largest cities in Europe. Before the epidemic, its population was around 300,000, which made it about the same size as Paris. Naples had a population of 270,000. London and Amsterdam, about 200,000. Venice and Antwerp, about 150,000. Rome, Genoa and Prague, 100,000. In five months, the plague claimed 150,000 lives, about half the population of Moscow. Bodies piled up in the streets. But the army still had to be paid, and the treasury was in plague-ravaged Moscow. If the epidemic spread to the troops, it would be a disaster. So the Tsar came up with the idea of literally laundering the money. He ordered the silver coins to be washed with soap and lye, before they were distributed to the troops. Plague never reached the army. The war with Poland lasted 13 years. Russians managed to win back some territory on their western border, but an empty treasury forced the Tsar to seek an armistice. In the truce of Andruzov, Russia won back Smolensk, Chernyakov, and other lands lost more than 50 years ago in the time of troubles. Eastern Ukraine also became part of the Russian state. To refill his treasury, Tsar Alexei decided to reform the currency. Because of the country's shortage of gold and silver, he introduced a copper coin with the same value as a silver coin. Wages were now paid out in copper, while taxes were still gathered in silver. The copper coins soon began to lose much of their value, but the Tsar's mints continued to produce them. Within five years, in Moscow, a single silver ruble was worth 12 or even 15 copper rubles. At the end of July 1662, when the Tsar was at his palace at Kalamonskoya, a few miles outside Moscow, posters appeared in the city, calling those responsible for minting copper coins thieves and traitors. The people of Moscow traveled to Kalamonskoya to see the Tsar. When he left church, he was surrounded by a huge, angry crowd. But Alexei kept his composure. He promised the people that the issue would be resolved. He even swore an oath to it. The crowd began to disperse. The Tsar's guards led him away. But more protesters kept arriving from Moscow, angrier and shouting insults at the Tsar. For a while, Alexei listened to their jeers in silence. The troops were already moving into position. When the Tsar saw that they encircled the crowd, gave the order, and the slaughter began. Two thousand five hundred people were killed at Kalamanskoya in just a few hours. The revolt was suppressed. The copper coinage had to be withdrawn. The state even offered compensation at five kopecks, or 5%, to the ruble. The Tsar's agents interrogated and tortured suspects for months to find out who'd been behind the riots. 150 were hanged. About 1,000 were sent into exile with the letter B branded on their faces. Obuntavshik, rebel. Tsaritsa was pregnant during the copper riot, as she'd been 14 years before during the salt riot. It was said the shock took its toll on her later, when the Tsaritsa died in childbirth. Their baby girl died just five days later. After the revolt, Tsar Alexei became deeply suspicious. He created a special section of the Department of Secret Affairs that combined the functions of counterintelligence, secret police, censorship, and a prison. It oversaw the work of all other state departments and was based not with them in the Kremlin, but at its own headquarters a few streets away at Lubyanka. 
torture was used routinely during its interrogations. It also relied on a large network of paid informers, including state bureaucrats, shopkeepers, and innkeepers. The Tsar had his own office within the department, from where he increasingly handled all affairs of state. The Department of Secret Affairs also continued to run the Tsar's household and entertainments, and produced the day reports, the first weather reports in Russian history. By the end of his reign, Alexei had surrounded himself with flatterers and yes-men, who competed with each other to sing the praises of their glorious monarch. His public appearances became increasingly formal and magnificent, with new ceremonies devised in detail by the Tsar himself. The Tsar, recently widowed, seemed set on the path towards aging despotism and ever-increasing isolation. But an encounter one evening, as he dined at the house of his friend, Artemon Matveyev, turned everything on its head. As per custom, the Tsar's first cup was presented by the host's young ward, the 19-year-old Natalia Narushkina. The Tsar was instantly captivated by her beauty and became determined to make her his wife. But proper protocol had to be observed. The selection of a new royal bride was announced, and 74 women of great beauty were brought to Moscow for the Tsar's appraisal. Only one of them knew the result had already been decided. Natalia Narushkina had won the Tsar's heart, and the selection was a mere formality. The wedding took place in the Kremlin, in the Cathedral of the Assumption, on February 1st, 1671. A year and a half later, the new Tsaritsa gave birth to a son. The boy would be known to history as Peter the Great. In his newfound joy, Tsar Alexei decided to realize a long-cherished dream, to build Russia's first professional theater. The theater was built in the village of Priobrzezhenskia, on the outskirts of Moscow. Pastor Johann Gregory from the city's German quarter was invited to write its first play, entitled The Comedy of Artaxerxes, based on the story of Esther from the Bible. All parts were played by students from the Lutheran school. The first performance took place on October 30th, 1672. The play lasted an exhausting 10 hours. The Tsaritsa and princesses watched from behind a screen that hid them from sight. Soon, five more plays had been staged, all based on stories from the Bible, as well as the first ballet, Orpheus. Tsar Alexei was filled with a new zest for life and a horror of growing old. He started to study medical textbooks and to use herbs to mix his own potions. He would listen attentively to his doctors and became obsessed with bloodletting, which was believed to restore the balance of the body's humors necessary for good health. He strongly recommended the practice for all his courtiers. It was said he sometimes let his favorite falcon make the incision, as the bird never missed the vein. In January 1676, Alexei caught a cold, which he decided to treat himself. But his health deteriorated rapidly, and within a week, his condition was without hope. On January 29th, the Tsar received the last rites and blessed his eldest son, Fyodor, as his heir and the next Tsar of Russia. He died the following night, aged 46. Alexei Romanov weathered many storms to leave behind a state that was rich, strong, and stable. His successors would build upon his legacy, carrying on the work of reform and modernization, none more so than his youngest son, Peter the Great, whose achievements would eclipse those of his father. Alexei died in the prime of his life, 
with many great ambitions unfulfilled, the country felt bereaved, as though it had lost a father. The heir to this mighty Russian state, Fyodor Alexeyevich, wasn't even able to attend his father's funeral unaided. His ill health meant he had to be carried to the cathedral on a special litter. Looking at the sickly face beneath the Tsar's fur hat, some whispered a warning. Prepare yourselves. Soon the nobles will be back in charge, and another time of troubles will be upon us. year was 1674. In the private theater of Tsar Alexei, the tale of the Byzantine princess Bulkaria was being retold. Long ago, she had been the elder sister of a Byzantine emperor, a seven-year-old boy given to daydreaming. So she ruled in place of her little brother and proved to be wise and fair. The tale delighted its royal audience, but one teenage princess, Sophia, was spellbound. This was her own dream, brought to life on stage. She had no idea where and how far that dream would lead her. Two years later, when Tsar Alexei's eldest surviving son took the throne as Fyodor III, the house of Romanov seemed secure and stable. The succession was not in dispute. Alexei himself had named and blessed Fyodor as his successor from his deathbed. There was one thing, though, that worried the people. The young Tsar had had to be carried to his coronation in a litter. He could barely walk on his own. As Fyodor ascended the throne, many at court openly hinted that the young Tsar was not long for this world. Chapter 1. Fyodor III Alexeyevich. Fyodor had suffered from chronic scurvy since childhood. It led to anemia, a blood disorder that left him profoundly weak. It also caused his limbs to swell and led to the abnormal development of his bones and cartilage. Scurvy is caused by an acute deficiency of vitamin C. In the 17th century, it was common during wars or long sea voyages. The first Romanovs, however, seem to have had a rare hereditary form of the disease. Because of his ill health, Theodore was forced to spend much of his time indoors, unable to take part in games or sport. Instead, he developed an interest in the sciences. His tutor was the philosopher and poet Simeon Polotsky, and Theodore was extremely well educated for his time. The young Tsar excelled in theology, philosophy, rhetoric, and poetry. He spoke fluent Polish and read Ovid in the original Latin. Fyodor owned a large music library, 
sang well and was a talented composer. But his greatest passion was for horse breeding. When Fyodor was only three, he was not given a toy horse like most other three-year-olds, but a real horse, because he was the son of a Tsar. The little boy was in awe. For the rest of his life, he would be obsessed with everything to do with horses. Fyodor's parents hoped that riding would improve the prince's health, but instead, their worst nightmare came true. One of his father's friends, Boyar noble Artemon Matveyev, witnessed the accident. When he was 13, Fyodor decided to travel to the countryside on sledge, along with his aunts and sisters. He was given a hot-tempered horse to pull the sledge, which he mounted. But there were so many people in the sledge that the horse couldn't move it. It reared, threw the rider off, and he fell under the sledge. It ran over Fyodor Alexeyevich with all its weight and crushed his chest. Fyodor survived, but to add to his woes, he suffered chest and back pain for the rest of his life. Fyodor was an enthusiastic follower of the latest European trends. He wanted to be a reformer, to sweep away all that was outdated and backward in Russia and bring in all the latest fashion and innovations from the West. But his illness left him effectively sidelined, a virtual prisoner in his own palace. Control of government fell into the hands of the Tsar's uncle, Ivan Miloslavsky, and his family. His rival, Artemon Matvyev, a brilliant diplomat and sworn enemy of the Miloslavsky clan, was sent into exile. Under the young Tsar, power once more lay with the Boyar nobles. Miloslavsky dismissed the Department of Secret Affairs and the Department of Accounting, the former instruments of royal government. He himself took over two key government departments, the Great Treasury, which controlled state finance, and the Department of Ambassadors, in charge of foreign policy, as well as other minor departments. Other departments were distributed amongst his friends and relatives, some of whom held up to half a dozen different government posts. In just a few years, the number of government departments increased from 42 to 60. The total number of bureaucrats rose from 882 to 2,762. This new bloated administration was riddled with corrupt and lazy officials, many of whom owed their place to the Miloslavsky family. It was love at first sight. On Palm Sunday, during the celebration of Christ's entry into Jerusalem, a solemn procession bearing icons and a crucifix crossed Red Square and entered the Kremlin Cathedral. Amid the crowd, one girl caught the eye of the 18-year-old Tsar. She stood out less for her beauty than for her proud and noble bearing. The Tsar was captivated. The girl was found. Her name was Agafia Grushetskia, the daughter of a petty nobleman who now lived with her uncle in Moscow. Fyodor instructed the uncle to keep his niece safe and not allow her to marry without his permission. But the Tsar's choice of bride did not suit the Miloslavsky family. They wanted him to marry a girl from their own family, not the daughter of some impoverished provincial noble. Fifty years later, the historian Vasily Tatishev investigated the facts and reported. Ivan Miloslavsky slandered Agafia in front of the Tsar, claiming that both she and her mother were known to be guilty of several obscene acts. But the girl found out about this unjust accusation, and when questioned by officials, declared that no one should be in any doubt as to her honor, and swore to it on her life. Reassured by this news, 
the Tsar decided to pay a secret visit to his chosen one. He took a trip through the hills outside Moscow, so on his way back he could pass by Agafia's house as if by accident. Agafia's relatives told the girl to stand in the window, and for the first time, their eyes met. Theodore took the first independent decision of his life. The scheming and deceitful Ivan Miloslavsky was dismissed from court. He was no longer welcome in the Tsar's presence. To respect tradition, a formal presentation of bridal candidates was arranged for the Tsar. But everyone knew the name of the winner before the contest even began. The Tsar, the candidates, and the organizers but it was unthinkable to overlook the ancient custom. Fyodor, now 19 and married, was at last recognized as having reached his majority and assumed the full authority of the Tsar. Now, he would take control of his own fate and push forward his own ideas on how Russia should be governed. His first act was to summon all the nobles of the realm, the most senior nobles, the boyars, his advisors, the okalnichi, and the members of the council. They were to meet at one o'clock to begin the work of reform, beginning with taxation. To support the Tsar's standing army, a variety of small taxes were replaced with a single new tax, Every household was now expected to pay 90 kopecks per year, the equivalent of 72 kilograms of grain or 26 kilograms of beef. Because of the acute shortage of cash, the Tsar sold the rights to collect this tax to tax farmers, helping to quickly replenish the treasury. By 1680, state revenues totaled more than 1.2 million rubles. Customs and excise duties accounted for 53% of revenue. Direct taxation raised 44% and other minor taxes accounted for the remainder. Next came a population census. Completed in 1678, it identified 5.6 million people living in Russia, but this only included taxpayers in the heartland regions. If non-taxpayers were added, plus those in new settlements on the fringes of Russia and across Siberia, as well as the Cossacks, the total population was approximately 12 million. This made Russia one of the world's most populated countries and largest in terms of territory. By the end of the Romanov dynasty in 1917, this population had grown eightfold to 103 million. Next was boundary reform. Existing boundaries were checked and new ones established, settling disputes over land ownership and fixing the boundaries of private estates, royal estates and church lands. Next, army reform. The most settled parts of Russia were divided into nine new military districts. From now on, every regiment was tied to one of these districts, was stationed there and did its recruiting there. Twenty years later, this system would be the basis for even more sweeping reforms by Fyodor's younger brother, Peter the Great. To help fight injustice, the Court of Petitions was reopened. A person of any rank or position could file a complaint to the Chamber of Judgment and to the Tsar personally. When Fyodor heard that some petitions compared the Tsar to God, he was indignant. He said that it was indecent to write such words, and that if anybody dared to write again in that style, he would not regard their petition with favor. Tsar Fyodor also reformed the penal code and abolished a range of barbaric punishments, including the cutting off of hands, feet, and fingers. Prisoners who would have received these punishments were now sent to Siberia instead, where they helped to settle and develop the vast, empty lands that lay beyond the Ural Mountains. Moscow, a city built of wood, used to be destroyed by fire about once every generation. In the reign of Tsar Fyodor, large parts of the city were rebuilt in stone for the first time. The state treasury offered 10-year interest-free loans to pay for the work. 
the Tsar would personally visit the site of fires to see the loans issued. Most of these medieval mortgages were never repaid, but they helped to build 10,000 new houses, creating a new city of stone. Finally, the system of precedence, by which the Boyar nobles could inherit government posts by virtue of rank alone, was abolished. From now on, appointments would be based on merit and the Tsar's judgment. Those, as it was put, whom the great sovereign indicates. The Tsar solemnly burned the great books of rank, which catalogued the pedigree and precedence of all Russia's noble families in a great bonfire in the courtyard of his palace. The Tsar had ushered in a new age in which good government took precedence over the boyar's ancient privileges. Tsar Fyodor was a man in a hurry. He introduced Polish fashion at court. Some courtiers even began to shave their beards. He encouraged the founding of Russia's first university based on European lines. He built a fortress at Izium to guard the southern border against Tatar raids and opened the first state almshouses in Russian history. He began work on reforming the courts. Sometimes it seemed his illness had deserted him but it never entirely left him. Theodore knew it was a race against time and there was much work to be done. War in the south against the Ottoman Turks and Crimean Tatars proved costly. It was a conflict that might have been avoided with the help of Artemon Matveyev, the Tsar's most experienced diplomat, but for now, he remained in exile. In 1677, a 100,000 strong Crimean Turkish army invaded Ukraine. It was met by a Russian Ukrainian army with a strength of 57,000 men. Despite being outnumbered almost two to one, they managed to repel the Turkish invader. The following year, a Turkish army 200,000 strong was defeated by a Russian army of 120,000. But Russian generals were unable to capitalize on these victories. In 1681, the Treaty of Bakhchisarai was signed between Russia, the Ottoman Empire, and Crimean Khanate. Eastern Ukraine and the city of Kiev remained in Russian hands. The Dnipro River became the new border with the Ottomans, while a buffer zone was created between the Dnipro and Bug River. The war had exhausted the Tsar, but with peace, his health began to improve. What's more, his beloved queen, his Tsaritsa, was pregnant with their first child. The baby was expected that summer. But their happiness was not to last. There were complications with the birth. Agafia died three days later, on July 14, 1681. Their infant son outlived his mother, by just six days. Fyodor was thrown into despair. His always frail health now began to deteriorate with alarming speed. Fyodor knew he needed an heir to ensure a peaceful succession when the time came. And seven months later, he married again. This time, his bride was a 14-year-old girl named Marfa Apraxina. Theodore did not even have the strength to stand during the wedding ceremony. Just 10 weeks later, he was dead at the age of 20. His final decline was so rapid, he didn't have time to leave instructions about his succession. Theodore had the potential to become Russia's first enlightened monarch, to lead Russia into the main current of European civilization. He had everything that was required, education, determination, character, everything, except health. The 
Tsar Fyodor III ruled Russia for just five years, but in that time he created the basis for one of the strongest armies in the world, introduced a system of social welfare, reduced taxation, expanded the borders of his realm, transformed Moscow from a city of wood into a city of stone, and laid the foundations of a secular system of education. He approved the foundation of Russia's first university, but died before he could sign the charter. Fyodor's death paved the way for a power struggle between two boyar families. The Miloslavskis, relatives of Tsar Alexei's first wife, the late Tsaritsa Maria, and the Narushkins, the family of Alexei's second wife, Natalia. The Miloslavskis' candidate for Tsar was Maria's son, Prince Ivan, a 15-year-old boy, half-blind and disabled. The Narushkin supported Natalia's son, Peter, healthy and clever, but only 10 years old. An hour after Fyodor's death, the Boyars Council, with the support of Patriarch Joachim, declared Prince Peter to be the new Tsar of Russia. His mother's family, the Narushkins, seemed to have won the day. For those at court, it meant one Boyar family was out and another was in. But for one person, it spelled the ruin of all their dreams. Chapter 2. Sofia Alexeyevna. Sofia Alexeyevna aspired to what most young women aspire to. Freedom, happiness, love. But her fate was not that of any ordinary woman. She was a Russian princess, daughter of Tsar Alexei, sister of the late Fyodor. In 1682, nine princesses lived in the Tsar's palace. They were Anna, Tatiana, Yevdokia, Martha, Sofia, Yekaterina, Maria, Fyodosia, and Natalia. None were permitted to marry. No Russian man was of sufficient rank, and foreigners did not share their orthodox faith. The princesses spent their lives in their chambers, in strict isolation from outsiders. They only left the palace for church or other important ceremonies. In their carriages, they sat behind closed curtains, and if they went anywhere on foot, they were shielded from public gaze by drapes held up by their attendants. Their only amusements were the swings of the palace park in summer, sledging in winter, and performances by the court musicians. Their lives were devoted to family, worship, and decorum. Princesses finished their education at the age of 10. They were taught to read and write, arithmetic, and theology. But Sophia begged her father to let her continue to study alongside her brother, Fyodor. Their teacher, Simeon Palotsky, remembered her as curious and clever, and that she studied philosophy, theology, rhetoric, Polish, and Latin. She read widely, and even wrote her own plays. Sophia's heroine was Pulcheria, a 5th century Byzantine princess who'd ruled as regent for her younger brother. It was what Sophia dreamed for herself, her brother, Tsar Fyodor, had occasionally listened to her advice, but no more. His death gave Sophia a long-awaited chance. Sophia was counting on her disabled brother Ivan becoming Tsar. Then she could become the Russian Pulcheria and rule for him as regent. But the Narushkins were about to thwart this plan by placing Peter, not Ivan, on the throne. So, Sophia decided to intervene. Her plan centered on the Streltsy, the musketeer units that were the core of the Russian standing army. There were 26 regiments, 22,500 men, stationed in Moscow. Their privileges included not having to pay taxes and being allowed to carry out private business when not on active service. A private soldier was paid between three and five rubles a month, equivalent to between 600 and 1,000 US dollars today. An officer was paid four times as much, between 15 to 20 rubles a month, while a colonel made between 30 and 60 rubles. Some unscrupulous colonels dipped into their soldiers' wages to augment their own pay. 
Streltsy wages were paid irregularly and late. Officers not only skimmed off some of their soldiers' pay, they sometimes made them work like serfs on their own estates. Streltsy had been pushed to breaking point. A situation Princess Sophia planned to use to her advantage. Meanwhile, the Narushkin's most able supporter, Artemon Matveyev, had just returned to Moscow from exile. This news persuaded Sophia to act without delay. Her supporters told the Streltsy that the Narushkins had poisoned Tsar Fyodor and strangled his son, Prince Ivan. At the insistence of Patriarch Joachim, Princes Ivan and Peter, both perfectly well, were shown to the public. But the Streltsy were out for blood. They broke into the palace, looking for the Narushkins and their supporters. Prince Ivan hid in a corner, while Prince Peter clung to Artemon Matveyev. The Streltsy pushed the young prince aside and dragged Matveyev away. A servant of the Patriarch witnessed the revolt and later described the scene. Artemon Matveyev was hacked to pieces. Boya Yuri Dolgorukov was dragged behind the gates and stabbed to death. The next day, his body was also cut into pieces. The Streltsy ransacked the treasury and entered the Tsar's chambers with weapons, looking for Boyar nobles to kill. They smashed down a door to the Patriarch's chambers and threw his steward from the window, where he hanged from the end of a rope. The Streltsy revolt traumatized young Peter. He would neither forget nor forgive. The massacre lasted for three days. The victims included prominent Narushkin supporters, including two of Prince Peter's uncles, two government ministers, the Tsar's personal doctor, and about 100 others. May 19th, the Streltsy demanded outstanding wages totaling 240,000 rubles. On May 23rd, they presented a new ultimatum. The two princes, Ivan and Peter, should sit on the throne together. Finally, on May 29th, they made their final demand. Princess Sophia was to become regent until Peter was of age. Russia had its Princess Pulcheria. Sophia was playing with fire. Just six weeks before, Peter had been proclaimed Tsar, and the Streltsy had sworn allegiance to him. Now they had butchered his close relatives and handed power to her. The princess had used armed men to clear her path to power. She wasn't the last to do so in Russia, but she went down in history as the first. The new princess regent realized her position was extremely precarious and moved quickly to shore up her support. First, she ordered the payment of all outstanding debts to the Streltsy, even melting down some of the Tsar's silverware to meet the cost. Then Sophia gave all the key posts to her allies. The ambassador's department, which handled foreign affairs, was given to her favorite, Count Vasily Galitsyn. Streltsy, writer cavalry and great treasury departments, effectively control of the army as well as state finances, were given to Count Ivan Kovansky, nicknamed the Windbag. Kovansky, a veteran general and favorite of the Streltsy, soon realized that his new position gave him almost unlimited power, a temptation he could not resist. So began the Kovanchina, the bloody summer of 1682, when power in Moscow resided with Kovansky and his Streltsy troops. The Russian capital had been occupied by its own army. Princess Sophia had unleashed a dangerous power struggle that threatened to topple Russia into anarchy. Thankfully, the Streltsy were not the only military force in Russia. Now, she would turn to the nobles.
On the day of the Feast of the Transfiguration, Princess Regent Sophia left the Kremlin under the guise of visiting the Donskoy Monastery, just across the Moscow River. But instead, she left the city and made for the Monastery of Trinity St. Sergius, where she planned to take refuge. From the safety of the monastery, Sophia sent letters across the land, condemning this new Streltsy revolt and summoning all loyal nobles to her aid. By the end of the 17th century, the nobleman's army or militia totaled 14 and a half thousand men. This amounted to 10% of the army. These men had received their lands in exchange for military service. Each year, they were expected to turn out for review mounted on their own horse, equipped with their own arms and accompanied by several armed serfs. They were obligated to join the army on campaign whenever required. The main part of the army, 77,000 men or 50%, were the so-called regiments of the new order. These were Reiter, Dragoon and Hussar cavalry units, made up mostly of foreign mercenaries. The troops now in revolt, the Streltsy musketeers, made up 35% of the army. Time was running out for Kavansky. His arrogant behavior had made him many powerful enemies. The Princess Regent's agents caught him in a tavern and brought him to their mistress outside Moscow. He was pushed to his knees before the Princess Regent read his crimes of treason and mutiny, and beheaded. His position as head of the Streltsy department would go to Fyodor Shaklaviti, Sofia's new favorite. The Streltsy revolt was over. The princess regent returned to Moscow and took residence in the Kremlin with Tsar Ivan, while Peter, regarded as the junior Tsar, moved to the palace of Priyabrzhenskia. Village of Priyabrzhenskia covered an area of 22 desiatinas, or 24 hectares. A wooden palace had been built there 20 years earlier and was the furthest royal residence from the Kremlin. Moscow's foreign quarter lay between the Kremlin and the palace. At Priobrezhenskoye, the young Tsar Peter devoted himself to war games, forming the local boys into so-called toy regiments. They would one day grow up to become the famous Priobrezhensky Guards Regiment. A fragile balance was achieved with Tsar Peter and his mother living at their country palace and Sofia and Tsar Ivan living in the Kremlin. A double throne was made for the joint rulers with a small window at the back. During audiences with foreign ambassadors, advisors whispered to the young Tsars through the window, telling them what to say. Peter was clever but still young, while it was much harder for his half-brother Ivan. Like many of the children from Tsar Alexei's first marriage, Ivan suffered from poor health, possibly linked to scurvy, leaving him weak and lethargic. He also had some form of intellectual disability and was almost blind. These severe health issues left him with little enthusiasm or interest in governing the state. So Princess Regent Sophia ruled with the help of her favorite and lover, Vasily Galitsyn, who now bore the grand title, Guardian of the Tsar's Great Seal and the state's great ambassadorial affairs. With Sofia's backing, Galitsyn worked out a breathtaking program of reform that was 150 years ahead of its time. Its starting point was the abolition of serfdom. But such radical ideas were impossible to realize at that time. Any attempt to free the serfs would have triggered a wholesale revolt of the nobles. Contemporaries called Vasily Galitsyn the Great 
He favored Western-style reforms, spoke five languages fluently, was a superb diplomat, and had a great breadth of knowledge. What's more, he was said to be the most handsome man in Moscow. Sofia was completely in love with him and wrote to him almost every day. In her letters, she told him how she prayed for his good health and urged him not to exhaust himself with endless work. Her gratitude, she wrote, was impossible to express. Without him, none of her achievements would have been possible. Galitsyn urged Sofia to continue her brother Fyodor's reforms, but she never fully grasped the need for such changes. What's more, she faced stubborn opposition from the Boyar nobles. Nevertheless, it was Sofia who opened Russia's first institute of higher education, the Slavonic Greek Latin Academy, based on the institute founded by Fyodor. Its first professors were two Greek brothers, both of them renowned scholars. A degree took 12 years. The main disciplines were Greek, Latin, grammar, rhetoric, philosophy, and theology. The academy was situated in the buildings of the Zykona Spassky Monastery. Today, it is the site of the Russian State University for the Humanities. The academy later spawned the Lamanosov Moscow State University the Russian Academy of Sciences, and the Moscow Theological Academy. In 1686, negotiations began with Russia's western neighbor, the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth. Galitsyn led a series of long and grueling discussions, which eventually led to the signing of a Treaty of Eternal Peace in Moscow. This bound the kingdoms of Princess Regent Sofia and King Jan Sobieski an alliance and was to prove the crowning achievement of Russian foreign policy in the 17th century. Russia's gains included the regions around Smolensk and Chernigov, as well as parts of eastern Ukraine and the cities of Zaporozhye and Kiev. The Treaty of Eternal Peace contained one additional clause. Russia was to join the Holy League, a military alliance against the Turkish Ottoman Empire. This obliged Russia to go to war against the Crimean Khanate, an Ottoman ally. But Galitsyn was not in favor of war and wanted to delay as long as possible. Despite his misgivings, Sofia placed Galitsyn in charge of the army for the forthcoming campaign. She dreamed of great victories that would unite Russia behind her and cover her beloved Galitsyn in glory. No sooner had he left for the front than Sofia began to write to him. In her letters, she called Galitsyn by his pet name, Vashenka, and worried endlessly about his safety. It was only when she embraced him with her own arms, she wrote, that she would know peace again. In May 1687, a 100,000-strong Russian army joined forces with Don and Zaporozhye Cossacks and advanced towards the Isthmus of Perekop. They found the fields had all been burnt, leaving no food for the horses. Some said it was the Cossacks, not the enemy, who burnt the land in fear of Russia's growing power. The campaign was cut short. The next year, an even bigger Russian army advanced south. The war's only battle was fought on May 15th, after which the Tatars retreated and the Russians advanced to Perekop. When the news reached Sofia in Moscow, she was ecstatic. Her letters back to Galitsyn overflowed with love and adulation and longing for the day they would be reunited. Galitsyn, however, could advance no further. In fact, he was already on his way back to Moscow. The scorched earth tactics of his enemy had starved his army of food and water, leading to the loss of half his men, even though there had been no major battles. The campaign was, in fact, a complete disaster. Galitsyn's role in this catastrophic defeat would not be forgotten. 
Later, when he was sent into exile, one of the main charges against him would be his ruinous handling of the Crimean campaign. On the eve of the debacle, he suffered the worst blow of all, the betrayal of his beloved. While Galitzin was away fighting, Sofia had fallen for another man, the cynical and scheming Fyodor Shaklovity. To flatter Sofia, he had brought the famous Ukrainian artist Alexander Tarasevich to Moscow to paint her portrait. He depicted the princess wearing a regal crown, scepter in hand, and behind her, a double-headed eagle. Sofia adored it. She ordered the portrait to be engraved in copper, so copies could be printed and sent to all the courts of Europe. By now, Sofia was styling herself by the grace of God, the great sovereign lady, the pious Tsarevna, the great princess Sofia Alexeyevna, autocrat of the great, the little, and the white Russias. At state ceremonies and ambassadorial receptions, she no longer felt the need to stand at a respectful distance behind the Tsar's throne. It was said her inspiration was the English queen, Elizabeth I. As soon as Tsar Ivan turned 18, Sofia arranged his marriage to the 20-year-old Praskovia Saltikova. Sofia was counting on the birth of a male heir to cement the Miloslavsky branch of the Romanov dynasty in power. The rival Narushkin branch had, of course, had the same idea. Peter was not quite 17 when his mother, the dowager Zaritsa Natalia, married him off to the 19-year-old Yevdokia Lapukina. She was neither clever nor educated, but healthy. The outcome of these marriages would shape the future of the Romanov dynasty for generations to come. Ivan and Praskovia had five daughters, but only three survived infancy. Yekaterina, Anna, and Praskovia. Anna later became Empress of Russia. Yekaterina's daughter, Anna Leopoldovna, became regent for the young Ivan VI but he was the last male of the romanov miloslavsky line. Peter and Yevdokia had three sons, but only the eldest, Alexei, lived. His son became Emperor Peter II, but he was the last male of the romanov narushkin line. On May 30th, 1689, Tsar Peter came of age. Sophia was now supposed to step down as regent, but she had no intention of giving up power. Instead, Shaklovity began spreading false rumors amongst the Streltsy regiments, claiming that the Narushkins planned to assassinate Sofia and Tsar Ivan and send the Streltsy away to garrison remote fortresses. The Streltsy were unhappy but would not risk open revolt. Then Shaklovity let it be known that those who joined his conspiracy would be paid two rubles for each private, 10 for each officer, 100 for each colonel, plus the right to plunder the houses of their victims. Moscow was on a knife edge. On the night of August 7th, loyal Streltsy officers arrived at Peter's palace. They told him that Shaklovity was planning to use the Streltsy to murder Peter and his family. Peter reacted with horror and outrage. Before fleeing to safety, he wrote a letter to Ivan, his brother and joint ruler. Our sister, Princess Sophia, runs our country as she wills. Bandits like Shaklaviti and his friends plan to murder us and our mothers. Now, brother Tsar, we shall rule our country on our own, since we are both men. Our sister has nothing more to do with it. It is shameful, Tsar, to be men and to have someone else rule in our place. That evening, Princess Sofia received a report that Peter's palace at Priorozhenskoye was empty. Tsar Peter, his mother, pregnant wife, and entire court had left for the Monastery of Trinity St. Sergius. 
His so-called toy regiments, now composed of young men, followed him there, together with one loyal Streltsy regiment. Rumors began to fly around Moscow. Everyone was on edge. But quickly, the mood began to turn against Sofia. August 13th, Sofia sent an emissary to Peter, Boyar Ivan Troyokurov, but the young Tsar would not negotiate. August 16th, Boyar Peter Prazorovsky visited the monastery with the same result. August 20th, Sofia begged Patriarch Joachim to visit Peter. He went, but did not return. He stayed with Peter. Boyars, officials, and even Streltsy began to flock to Peter's rival court. August 27th, Sophia left to negotiate with her brother in person. She realized that she shouldn't, that her humiliation would likely be in vain, but she could not simply sit and wait. Six miles from the monastery, near the spot where she had had the Streltsy leader Kovansky executed seven years before, she was met by Troyokurov, her own emissary from just two weeks ago. He handed her Peter's order to turn back. August 31st, Sofia returned to the Kremlin, where she gathered the Streltsy in the square. She told them that Peter's advisors sought to divide them by inventing plots against Peter's life, but that she was confident of their loyalty to her her speech made little impact. Only loyal Shaklaviti remained by her side. September 4th, the foreign regiments under General Gordon went over to Peter's side. September 6th, Streltsy arrested Fyodor Shaklaviti and took him to Peter for sentencing. September 7th, Vasily Galitsyn came to see Peter. The Tsar refused to meet him and sent him into exile. September 8th, the title of Tsarevna, royal princess, was officially stripped from Sofia. September 9th, Troyakurov informed Sofia of the Tsar's will. She was to enter the monastery of Novodevichy and remain there for the rest of her life. September 12th, Shaklaviti was beheaded by the main road outside the Trinity Monastery. October 16th, the Tsar's court, boyars and army returned to Moscow and Peter I took up the reins of government. His elder brother, Ivan V, remained joint ruler, taking part in ceremonies when his strength allowed. But his health continued to decline. Soon, Ivan found it difficult to walk and was almost completely blind. He died seven years later, on February the 8th, 1696, aged just 29. Princess Sophia lived under guard in a tower of the Novodichi Monastery. She received food from the Tsar's table, as well as an allowance of 2,600 rubles a year, the same as the other royal princesses. A small staff of servants lived with her, an old nanny, two clerks and nine maids. For nine years, Sophia lived quietly in the monastery, reflecting on her years of power and the fate of her two lovers, one executed, the other exiled to the north. But she also continued to intrigue, exchanging secret letters with her supporters. In June 1698, Peter was in Holland learning to build ships. But back home, poor treatment led 4,000 Streltsy to kill their officers and march on Moscow, intending to restore Sofia to the throne. They were met by government troops, the Priobrzezhensky Regiment, the Semenovsky Regiment, the Lofortov Regiment, the Foreign Regiment under General Gordon and the Nobles Militia under General Shane. Streltsy were defeated at New Jerusalem, 30 miles from Moscow, and reprisals began. General Shane conducted the initial investigation. He had 130 Streltsy hanged, 
140 whipped and sent into exile, and 1,960 banished to remote regions. But in August, Peter returned to Moscow and renewed the investigation. He had another 2,000 Streltsy executed and 600 more flogged and branded. Streltsy corpses were hung from the walls of the Kremlin and Sofia's residence, the Novodevichy Monastery. Streltsy property was plundered, and even the 16 regiments that didn't take part in the revolt were disbanded. Princess Sophia was forced to take the veil under the name of Susanna. Boyars close to her were interrogated and then banished to distant monasteries. Her allowance was slashed, her staff changed and security tightened. The bodies of three Streltsy hung by the window of her cell for five months. She had struck terror at court, won the favor of any man she wanted, held the power to invoke and quell revolts, waged wars, and concluded brilliant peace treaties. She dreamed of becoming a real ruler, like the Byzantine princess Pulcheria, whose tale had captivated her as a child. She had defied all the odds to make her dream a reality, becoming the first Russian princess to escape her secluded existence, the first to live life and wield power. But in the end, her downfall was complete. For seven years of rule, she spent 15 years in a monastery cell. She died in 1704, aged 46, and was buried in the cemetery of the Novodevici Monastery. By the time of her death, Great changes were sweeping over the country she had once ruled. Changes that would transform Russia forever. The history of the old Russian state was at an end. The history of a new Russian empire was beginning. Peter, Tsar of Russia, was exploring the boat sheds when he discovered a type of boat he'd never seen before. He asked the boatwright who had built this remarkable craft. He was told it was an English boat. Its construction allowed it to sail into the wind as well as away from it. Peter was amazed. All his victories were to defy tradition, expectation, common sense, and sometimes even the laws of physics. The spirit of his reign was summed up with the words inscribed on his medals. Even the impossible is possible.
Peter was 10 years old when he first came face to face with a violent mob. Rebels from the Streltsy Infantry Regiments dragged away his friends and relatives and butchered them like cattle. The trauma caused Peter to suffer from convulsions for the rest of his life. No one could have guessed that this terrified boy would one day sweep away the old Russia and build a new one in its place. Chapter 1. Peter I. Alexeyevich. Peter was the youngest son of Tsar Alexei I and not expected to inherit the throne. Alexei died when Peter was just four and was succeeded by his eldest son, Fyodor III. But when Fyodor died just six years later, the nobles decided 10-year-old Peter would succeed him, bypassing the middle brother, 15-year-old Ivan, who was severely disabled. After a revolt by the Streltsy regiments, real power fell into the hands of their ambitious sister, Sophia, who ruled as princess regent. Peter and his mother, the dowager Tsaritsa Natalia, were sent to live on the Priabrzhensky estate on the outskirts of Moscow. There, Peter formed all the boys his own age into a toy regiment for his elaborate war games. The young Tsar was obsessed with war, not just with armies, but navies too. He took his toy regiment to Lake Glesievo, 80 miles north of Moscow, where they learned to build and sail boats and experiment with naval tactics. Tsar Peter was remarkable in many ways, but most obviously in physical stature. At six foot seven, or 204 centimeters, he towered nearly half a meter over most of his contemporaries. What's more, his gigantic body had unusual proportions. He had very long arms with massive hands, but small feet, narrow shoulders, and a small head. His face was handsome, but became contorted when he was worried or anxious, the legacy of his childhood traumas. All his life, Peter was filled with inexhaustible energy. He could barely stand still and was always looking for some exciting activity to throw himself into. Unlike his older brothers, he didn't get expert tutors. He didn't even finish his education and made spelling mistakes his entire life. When his mother, Tsaritsa Natalia, received her restless son's letters from Lake Vesievo, they made her both laugh and cry. This is a letter for my dearest mother, Tsaritsa and Great Duchess Natalia Kirilovna, from her boy Petrushka, who is working constantly. Thanks to your prayers, we're all well. The lake is no longer covered with ice and all the boats are being repaired. We need rope, though. I beg you to send me 700 fathoms of rope. Then we'll be able to proceed. With that, I ask for your blessing. Peter was fascinated by everything to do with craftsmanship. By the age of 18, he knew smithing, carpentry, wood turning, and shoemaking. He'd studied military science, fortification and shipbuilding, and learned German by speaking to men from the foreign quarter. This was an area of Moscow set aside for foreigners, established in 1652 when Peter's father, Tsar Alexei, ordered all non-Orthodox Christians to move to a new settlement outside the city. The new foreign quarter was built just outside the walls along the Yauza River. It was self-governed and home to Europeans of all nationalities. Most were military men, doctors or craftsmen, all seeking professional opportunities in Russia. The foreign quarter was just a few miles from Peter's palace at Priobrzhenskia. Every day he saw the spires of its Lutheran churches and heard the sounds of bustling activity from within its walls. 
Unable to contain his curiosity any longer about how these Europeans lived, he decided to pay a visit. He would soon make himself at home. Swiss soldier Franz Lefort was an experienced officer, handsome, capable, and well connected. He was also a society host of some note, and Tsar Peter became a regular guest at his house. Franz Lefort soon joined the Tsar's inner circle, becoming one of Peter's most trusted friends and advisors. He also introduced Peter to his servant, Alexander Menshikov destined to become another of the Tsar's closest confidants. And then there was Anna Mons, the daughter of a Dutch wine merchant, who soon became Peter's lover. Peter became a regular visitor to the foreign quarter, learning to speak German and Dutch, dancing with girls, drinking wine and smoking his pipe. Naturally, when his mother found out, she was horrified. In the hope of encouraging him to settle down, she decided Peter should get married. His bride was the 19-year-old Yevdokia Lupikina. She seemed an ideal match, tall, beautiful, sensible, and extremely pious. But just two months after the wedding, the new husband left for Lake Pleshevo. Meanwhile, unrest was brewing in Moscow. Princess Regent Sophia was refusing to relinquish power, and her agents were trying to incite Streltsy troops to murder Peter and his family at Priobrzenskia. When loyal Streltsy officers arrived one hot August night to warn him of the plot against his life, Peter lost his nerve. He ran out into the courtyard wearing only his nightshirt, mounted a horse, and rode off into the forest on his own. The next morning it emerged he'd ridden to the monastery of Trinity San Sergius. He sent word for his family, his court, and all loyal troops to join him there. Nobles and generals, sick of Sophia's rule, sided with Peter. Sophia was banished to a monastery, and Peter took power. His first challenge was war. Russia had recently agreed to join Poland and Austria as a member of the Holy League, an alliance of Christian states fighting the Muslim Ottoman Empire. Their ultimate goal was to capture the Ottoman capital, Constantinople. Sophia had waged two wars against the Ottomans' ally, the Crimean Khanate. In 1695, Peter decided to attack the Ottomans themselves, targeting the fortress of Azov, which blocked Russia's access from the Don River to the Sea of Azov. Peter would fulfill his obligation to the Holy League while winning a strategic port for Russia. For the first time, the Russian army moved not by land, but by river, traveling down the Volga and Don on specially constructed barges. Peter himself held the rank of senior artillery officer and was the army's chief gunner. At first, it all seemed just a grander version of his war games and mock battles, but not for long. Two attempts to storm the fortress were repulsed, and Peter was forced to order a retreat. All winter, new vessels were built and launched from Varanej in the Don's upper reaches. By spring of 1696, the first Russian fleet, consisting of two large warships, 23 ore-powered galleys, and one and a half thousand smaller vessels, sailed down the Don to Azov. The fortress was now besieged not just from land, but from sea as well. Within a month, this combined assault forced the Turks to surrender the fortress. The Russians also won their first naval victory, defeating an Ottoman fleet that attempted to break the siege. Peter returned to Moscow in triumph, 
but he needed allies to continue his war against the Ottoman Empire. He formed a grand embassy to travel to Europe, which he would accompany himself, traveling incognito under the name Peter Mikhailov. Peter appointed his head steward, Fyodor Ramadanovsky, to take over his duties in Moscow, conferring on him, jokingly, the title Prince Caesar. He was entrusted with the care of the Tsar's family, Tsaritsa Yevdokia and their six-year-old son, Prince Alexei. Peter's actions were without precedent. The court was horrified, but no one dared to object. Many years later, the engineer Andrei Natov described the reaction in his memoirs. Who ever heard or read of a ruler who, having taken the throne, left behind his crown and scepter, entrusted rule to one of his nobles, and left to wander through strange lands? It was completely unheard of, but this is what happened in Russia. At last, the Tsar got to see the world that he had read and dreamed about since his youth. Europe fascinated Peter. Not so much the art or the music, which rather bored him, but everything to do with science, technology and industry. And he wanted to try everything with his own hands. In the Netherlands, Peter Mikhailov got a job as a carpenter in a shipyard to learn how the Dutch built their ships. In England, he also visited the docks to study shipbuilding. Foreigners didn't know what to make of him. This strange, gangly Russian who wanted to go everywhere, see everything, and try it for himself. He was curious about everything. How whales were hunted, how the sick were treated, how paper was made. Wherever he went, he tried to persuade specialists to move to Russia to share their expertise with his people. Some even agreed. But Peter's main goal, to find allies for his war against the Turks, failed. Europe's great powers were too busy preparing for their own war to settle the issue of Spanish succession. No one had time for an alliance with far-off Russia. But in Poland, Peter did manage to find an ally to fight Sweden, his northern rival. Augustus, king of the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth and elector of Saxony, was said to be the strongest man in Europe. When the two rulers met, they agreed to dine together. One observer later recalled that when King Augustus saw that a silver dish on the table wasn't clean, he picked it up and rolled it into a tube with his bare hands. Tsar Peter, thinking the Polish king was trying to intimidate him, picked up another silver plate and did exactly the same. The two rulers began picking up and bending all the dishes within reach. As they sat down laughing, Tsar Peter joked, Brother Augustus, we bend silver fairly, but it will be much harder work to bend Swedish iron. Peter hoped that a victorious war against Sweden would allow Russia to reclaim former territories in the Baltic, particularly the eastern shore of the Gulf of Finland. This would give Russia access to the Baltic and a sea route to Europe. But Peter's festivities were interrupted by bad news from home. In the summer of 1698, the Streltsy troops, whose revolt had so scarred him as a child, rebelled once more. Rebel regiments were now marching on the capital. To Moscow, they declared, we'll destroy the foreign quarter and beat the foreigners who reject our orthodox faith. To Moscow, come hell or high water, for we have a higher purpose. We will keep the Tsar out of Moscow and kill him for his faith in these foreigners. Peter traveled 300 miles in four weeks to reach Moscow. 
But by the time he arrived, his deputy, Fyodor Ramadanovsky, had defeated the rebels and begun dealing with the ringleaders. 130 Streltsy were executed. 150 more flogged and exiled to Siberia. But it was not enough for Peter. He ordered new interrogations and more torture, some of which he attended personally. A public mass execution was arranged in Moscow. 800 Streltsy were beheaded in Red Square. Hundreds more were hanged from the walls of the Kremlin. Peter beheaded five rebels himself. Noblemen and foreign diplomats witnessed the bloodbath. Around 2,000 Streltsy were executed in total. 800 flogged and sent to Siberia. Streltsy was now a word that Peter equated only with anarchy and revolt. After the executions, he decided to make some changes, both in his own life and his kingdom. He forced his unloved wife, Yevdokia, to become a nun and entrusted the care of their eight-year-old son, Alexei, to his sister, Natalia. Peter began to live openly with his Dutch lover, Anna Mons. The conservative Russian nobility was shocked, but Peter didn't care. Then, Peter made it compulsory for all nobles and townsmen to shave their beards off and wear European-style clothes. The only people allowed to keep their beards were peasants, priests of the Orthodox Church, and those who paid a hefty beard tax. A beard permit costs 600 rubles a year for a nobleman, worth about $100,000 today, and 30 rubles for a servant, or $5,000 today. Peter also forced his court to adopt European customs. Wives and daughters had to wear European dresses. Everyone had to know how to dance and make polite conversation. Courtiers had to brush their teeth every morning, drink coffee, shun traditional Russian food like pickled cabbage, and eat more Dutch dishes. Peter reformed the calendar so that years were no longer counted from the date of creation, but from the birth of Christ like the rest of Europe. Overnight, the year 7,208 became 1,700. And New Year was moved from September the 1st to January the 1st. In honor of the occasion, the Tsar instructed his people to decorate fir trees, entertain their children, and go sledging. Adults, he instructed, were not to drink and fight. There were enough days of the year for that already. The first New Year festivities led to a huge fire that almost burned down Moscow. Peter was not concerned. He didn't care much for old Moscow. Besides, he was preoccupied with preparations for his war against Sweden. A secret alliance with the Polish King Augustus II and the King of Denmark and Norway, Frederick IV, had now been signed. Both kings looked on Tsar Peter as the junior partner. Their adversary was the 18-year-old King Karl XII of Sweden, a lover of hunting and parades who no one took seriously. In the spring of 1700, Augustus, ruler of the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, launched an offensive in the Baltic and laid siege to the Swedish-held city of Riga. But for the King of Denmark, the war quickly took a disastrous turn when the Swedish fleet appeared unexpectedly outside Copenhagen. Unable to defend his capital, the Danish king was forced to make peace with Sweden. Soon, Augustus was forced to withdraw from Riga, leaving Peter, with his ill-trained forces, to face the greatest army in Europe alone. Russian troops were besieging Narva on the Baltic coast, but they didn't have enough artillery to break down its walls. After two weeks, the main Swedish army began to close in. As it approached, Peter appointed the Duc de Croix as commander-in-chief and left for Novgorod. 
He was not there to see the outnumbered Swedish infantry attack through the blizzard and inflict a crushing defeat on the Russian army. He didn't see the surrender of his hired foreign officers or the moment his men cast their banners at the feet of the Swedish king. Peter had lost one army. Now he had to forge a new one. His military reforms would create Russia's first regular army, a professional force made up of full-time conscript soldiers. Military service was required from all nobles and peasants were expected to send one man from every 20 households who served for life. Troops were rigorously trained in drill, while Peter's toy regiment formed the basis for two new elite units, the Preobrazhensky Guards and Semenovsky Guards. Soldiers also received new weapons, rapiers and flintlock muskets instead of the old arquebuses. In 10 years, the Russian army was expanded to a strength of 200,000 men, supported by a force of 100,000 Cossack cavalry. Peter had created the largest and most modern army in Russian history. After the catastrophe at Narva, Peter needed to replenish the treasury quickly. He reduced the amount of silver in the coins, providing more cash in the short term but devaluing the currency, driving prices up. He was pushing the country to the edge of another rebellion. He was making people dress up like heretics, forcing them to cut off their beards, and now forcing them to pay for his disastrous war. There were rumors that the Tsar who'd returned from abroad was a different man. The real Tsar, it was said, was in prison far across the sea. Others openly called him the Antichrist. Peter didn't care. Instead, he ordered church bells to be taken down and melted into cannon. Peter's draconian taxes were bleeding Russia dry and triggering riots and revolts across the land. But the money paid for two large warships, the beginning of the Russian Baltic fleet, and allowed him to open foundries in the Urals that were soon supplying the army and navy with modern cannon. The introduction of modern artillery, combined with the effect of reforms and spending increases, soon brought results. Russia could now wage war against Sweden as an equal. Victories followed, with the Russian army capturing the fortresses of Nöteberg, Nienschanz, Narva and Marienburg. On the eve of this last victory, the Tsar received bitter news. His mistress, Anna Mons, who'd lived with him like a wife for 10 years, had been cheating on him. The passion of their youth was long gone, but her betrayal was still painful to Peter. His loyal friend and associate, Prince Menshikov, helped the Tsar to overcome his heartbreak by finding him a new mistress, the beautiful and charming Marta Skavronskia, recently liberated by Russian forces from the fortress city of Marienburg. Marta turned out to be the woman that Peter needed in his life. Two years later, he brought her to Priabrzhenskia as his bride where she converted to orthodoxy and took the name Catherine Alexeyevna. This kind and gentle woman, who had once served as a housemaid and remained illiterate all her life, would bear Peter 11 children and in time be crowned Empress of Russia. For now, the Great Northern War ground on. On Hare Island, where the river Neva flows into the Gulf of Finland, the Russians began to build a fort with six bastions. Named the Peter and Paul Fortress, it guarded the first Russian port on the Baltic Sea. This was destined to be the site of a new Russian capital, St. Petersburg. In six months, the first foreign ship would arrive at the port. Three years later, 
the first warships would be launched from the city's Admiralty shipyard. Peter's dream of dominating the Baltic Sea was within reach. The construction of the Tsar's new capital was beset with difficulties and, needless to say, hugely expensive. First, the marshes had to be drained, then numerous dams and dikes put in place to protect the land from flooding. It took 20,000 logs to build just one dike. Today, it would take 20 freight trains to deliver this much timber. Each year, 40,000 laborers arrived to help build the new city. And for the first time, the Tsar authorized the use of thousands of prisoners as convict labor. They were formed into labor battalions, working for up to 15 hours a day, and even around the clock during the white nights of summer. In 15 years, these brutal conditions would claim the lives of an estimated 100,000 workers. Europe paid little attention to Peter's victories. All they saw was a greedy czar of the Muscovites seizing a piece of boggy shoreline and hurriedly settling in there. They were much more interested in his enemy, Karl XII of Sweden, waging war in the heart of Europe against the Polish King Augustus. In 1706, Karl defeated Augustus, forced him to give up his throne, and then turned on Russia. The two armies met on June 27, 1709, four miles outside Poltava. Both monarchs led their armies in person. On the eve of battle, Karl addressed his troops. He promised them that the next day they'd eat at the table of the Tsar of Russia. He's prepared many dishes for us. Go where glory calls. Tsar Peter also spoke to his troops. Soldiers, a time has come that will decide the fate of our motherland. Do not think you are fighting for Peter. You are fighting for the state he is entrusted with for your families, your motherland, for our Orthodox Church. The Swedish army at Poltava had a strength of 8,000 infantry, 8,000 cavalry, and just four cannon. The Russian army consisted of 25,000 infantry, 9,000 cavalry, and 73 cannon. The battle raged for 10 hours and ended in a brilliant victory for the Russian army. Russian losses were 1,300 men killed and 3,300 wounded. The Swedes suffered 8,000 casualties, almost twice as many as the Russians, while 4,000 were taken prisoner and 17,000 more lost during the retreat. The Battle of Poltava ended 100 years of Swedish military dominance in Europe, though Karl remained a threat as long as he still commanded a powerful navy. The rest of Europe, however, was forced to recognize that Russia, long regarded as wild and backward, was now a force to be reckoned with. Peter had turned his back on Moscow, its onion domes, winding streets and apple orchards. His favorite place in the whole world was now St. Petersburg. Peter described these boggy, windswept islands as paradise. He liked to oversee as much of the work as possible himself, including the construction of the Summer Palace, inspired by the stately homes and gardens he'd visited in Europe. Every day Peter spent here was a happy one, as he watched his new capital rise up around him. He ordered that every cart entering the city had to bring three large stones with it, weighing not less than five pounds. These were used to turn streets of mud into the city's first paved roads. Peter could already see the great palaces, wide boulevards, parks and promenades that would one day make this city the Venice of the North. But Peter's quest to modernize Russia was far from complete. Everything had to change. Finances, bureaucracy, laws. 
There was no master plan. It would be step by step, as dictated by necessity. And the most pressing need was for money. Peter's tax reform centered on the creation of a poll tax to be paid once a year by every male subject in the realm. Peasants had to pay 74 kopecks, about $100 today. While those living in towns had to pay nearly double, 1.2 rubles, about $200 today. Peasants in some parts of the country were now taxed for the first time, including inhabitants of the far north, Siberia, and the Volga region. State revenue tripled, providing Peter with the money necessary for further reforms. Peter saw his work as a sacred duty and himself as the motherland's faithful servant. He expected the same from all his subjects, regardless of rank, from the grandest noble to the humblest peasant. To ensure the smooth running of the state, he created the post of fiscal, a secret informer who sniffed out corruption, which was then punished brutally to deter others. But bribe-taking and embezzlement remained endemic. For every 100 rubles collected in state taxation, scarcely 30 reached the state treasury. The greatest embezzler of all was the Tsar's close friend, Prince Menshikov, whose income almost equaled that of the state. Peter finally lost all patience, declaring that if someone stole even just enough money to buy himself a piece of rope, that rope would be used to hang them. Menshikov talked him down, warning that if he passed such a law, he'd soon have no subjects left. Peter was involved in drawing up statutes and charters for many new bodies, from the Academy of Sciences to the Admiralty, as well as issuing hundreds of decrees. The Tsar legislated on almost every aspect of Russian life, from the type of boot polish used to the width of cloth that was produced, the profits of merchants, the proper way to construct stoves, farming implements, the correct form of wedding, the treatment of the sick, what sort of coffin should be used to bury the dead, and how many times a week a sauna should be heated. And there were more. Each new law stipulated the punishment for breaking it, a fine for talking in church, the death penalty for treason. To Peter, it was clear. His subjects were like children who couldn't be trusted to run their lives without his supervision. He didn't ask their opinion, of course, nor did he ask the opinion of his son, Alexei, whose life he also governed in every small detail. Tsarevich Alexei was the son of Peter's first wife, Yevdokia, who was banished to a convent when he was eight. He was raised instead by his aunt, Princess Natalia, Peter tried to involve Alexei in affairs of state and took him on campaign when he was just 12. The boy showed early promise with an aptitude for languages and mathematics. But Peter's bullying behavior caused Alexei to fear and eventually loathe his own father and secretly wish him dead. The Tsar's enemies persuaded Alexei to flee to Vienna he was signing his own death warrant. Russian agents soon found him and brought him back to face his father's judgment. The prince was terrified. Under torture, he named all those he knew to be enemies of the Tsar and renounced his right to inherit the throne. He had fled, it emerged, because he was convinced his father intended to have him killed. The prince was imprisoned in the Peter and Paul fortress. On June 25, 1718, a court found Alexei guilty of treason and sentenced him to death. The next day, the prince was found dead in his cell. The official cause of death was an apoplectic fit. The real cause cannot be proved. What is known is that the prince was cruelly tortured for days during his interrogation. The day after his son's death, 
Peter celebrated the ninth anniversary of the Battle of Poltava. But those close to him could see his grief. I suffer for the entire motherland, he wrote. My enemies play vile tricks against me. It's hard for people to believe in my innocence as they know none of the facts. But God sees the truth. Peter could see with brutal clarity how precarious his achievements were. If he died, everything would collapse. And the Tsar was not a well man. The opinion of Peter's doctor, Laurentius Blumentrost, was that his 44-year-old patient suffered from chronic bronchitis, inflammation of the bowels, chronic kidney disease, kidney stones, a swollen liver, and damaged nerves. Peter wasn't good at following diets or cutting down on alcohol. Instead, he went to spas to take the local mineral water. Peter was now spurred on by a sense of his own mortality. First, he needed to end the Great Northern War, now in its 20th year. Even after Karl XII fell in battle, Sweden would not make peace and refused to recognize Peter's Baltic conquests. Russia would first have to defeat Sweden's navy. In 1714, at Gangut, the Russian galleys won their first victory over the Swedes. Six years later, at Grengum, they captured four Swedish frigates. Sweden then signed an alliance with Britain, and a joint Anglo-Swedish squadron approached Russia's Baltic fleet base at Reval. It was then forced to withdraw. In 1721, the war ended with the Treaty of Nystadt. Sweden recognized Russian ownership of Ingria, which became the province of St. Petersburg, Livonia, modern Latvia and southern Estonia, Estland, now northern Estonia, and part of Karelia. Russia had its Baltic Sea outlet, and with it, the status of a European power. The Russian Senate asked Peter to accept the title Father of the Nation, Peter the Great, Emperor of all Russia. The moment marked the end of the Russian Tsardom and the birth of the Russian Empire. But what future for the House of Romanov? Few of Peter's children had survived infancy. His heir, Peter, died at the age of three. He had two adult daughters. Anna and Elizabeth, and a grandson, little Peter, the son of the late Tsarevich, Alexei. But Peter didn't want the boy to succeed him yet, fearing he would become the puppet of his enemies, who would try to undo all his reforms. Peter decided to change the ancient customs of succession. He issued a decree allowing a ruler to choose their successor. Let the ruler be always free, it said to choose to whom they will give their inheritance. In the spring of 1724, at the Cathedral of the Assumption in the Kremlin, Peter solemnly crowned his wife, Catherine, as Empress. Did it mean he intended to leave the throne to her? Tsar made no mention of the matter. Soon after the coronation, Peter learned that Catherine had been unfaithful to him and that her lover was the brother of his former Dutch mistress, Anna Mons. It was a heavy blow. Catherine was Peter's greatest love and closest companion. She was the only one able to calm his outbursts of rage. The German diplomat, Count Henning Friedrich Basevich, witnessed such a scene more than once. He used to have fits, caused by a dark thought entering his head that someone was trying to kill him. These episodes were a nightmare for those closest to him. They knew a fit was coming when his mouth started to shake. They would immediately send for the Empress. She would start talking to him, and the sound of her voice calmed him down. She used to make him sit down and would then take his head in her hands, brushing it gently. It was like magic. He'd fall asleep in a matter of minutes. So as not to disturb him, she'd hold his head against her chest, 
and sit without moving for two or three hours. After that, he'd wake up, fresh and invigorated. Peter had never been a faithful husband. On campaign, he would bed the servants and the soldiers' wives, and even established a set fee for their services, one ducat per night. Nor did the ladies of court escape the Tsar's attention. In his father's day, women were kept out of sight. Now, instead of being treated like slaves, it was said, they were worshipped like goddesses. The many sudden changes to Russian customs, social norms and dress were soon being blamed for a collapse in morality. The Tsar himself set a terrible example. His lovers included Mary Hamilton, a lady-in-waiting, Countess Avdotya Chernyshova, Countess Maria Rumyantseva, the Romanian Countess Maria Kantemir, and Elizaveta Sinyavskia, all of whom slept with Peter with the full knowledge of their fathers or husbands. Catherine had tolerated all of the Tsar's affairs and never reproached him for them, but that was expected. Peter had Catherine's lover arrested and charged with accepting bribes to avoid public disgrace. The investigation was swift. He was found guilty in five days and dead in eight. Peter had his severed head preserved in alcohol and placed in a jar. Then, it was rumored, he delivered this gruesome gift to Catherine's chambers in person. Emperor and Empress did not speak for nearly a year. They neither dined nor slept together. But in the autumn of 1724, Peter's health suddenly got worse. He'd continued to ignore his doctor's advice. Now he would pay the price. On January the 16th, Peter was too ill to leave his bed. He called for the Empress. They talked for three hours. All that time, Catherine knelt beside him. At last, they made peace and forgave each other. The next day, Peter was in excruciating pain, but the doctors could provide no relief. His screams echoed through the palace. Catherine did not leave his bedside. On January 22nd, in between fits, Peter confessed his sins. Five days later, he asked for a desk to write his will. He didn't know that in the next room, generals and senators were discussing the succession. For many of them, it was a matter of life and death. One half, Dukes Dalgaruki, Yalitsin and Repnin, were for the 10-year-old Peter, the late Prince Alexei's son. The other half, new men like Menshikov and Tolstoy, who'd led the investigation against Prince Alexei, feared his son would seek to avenge his father. They wanted the Empress to take the throne. Peter wrote just two words, give everything, and fainted. At 4 a.m., the Senate decided the throne must go to Catherine. She was still at the Tsar's bedside, at 10 past five, he died in her arms. The low-born Tsaritsa to succeed her husband caused a stir, but nothing to do with Peter's reign could shock the Russians anymore. She would be Russia's second female ruler in 30 years, and there was great sympathy for Catherine. Her life was a fairy tale, a housemaid who'd captured the heart of a Tsar, become his queen and empress.
Chapter 2. Catherine I. Alexeyevna. The Empress knew nothing about ruling a state. She couldn't even read and write. The only thing she ever mastered was how to sign her own name. But that was enough to authorize the founding of a Russian Academy of Sciences, as Peter had always dreamed, and to authorize Vitus Bering's expedition to the Far East. On the whole, Catherine left the governing to others and devoted herself to parties and drinking. She drank ferociously, took many lovers, and danced till dawn. A typical day for the Empress began when she rose from bed at four o'clock in the afternoon. She dined at eight, then took a walk in the summer garden. She usually went to bed around 10 o'clock the next morning. Her court was dominated by the serene Count Alexander Danilovich Menchikov. It was he who had first introduced Catherine to Peter. Then he had put her on the throne. Now he held the reins of power. He ruled through a new body, the Supreme Privy Council. Formerly, its role was to advise the Empress, but in reality, it ran the country. Catherine didn't attend the council meetings. She had no interest. She listened to its reports, but for no more than half an hour. Any longer gave her a headache. The Empress's dissolute lifestyle soon led to serious health problems. She put on weight and suffered from kidney disease and a heightened pulse. It was plain to see that Catherine would not live much longer. So Menchikov began to plan for the future, persuading the Empress to sign a will by which Prince Peter would inherit the throne, but only after he married Menchikov's daughter. On May the 6th, 1727, Catherine I died. She would be remembered as a kind and merry Tsaritsa and a loyal companion of Peter the Great. Many had believed that without Peter the Great's iron will, Russia would revert to being a second-rate power on the margins of Europe. But Peter's reforms had created an unstoppable momentum of their own. In St. Petersburg, palaces were rising along the shores of the Baltic. Gardens were planted and wide boulevards paved. They were the first in Russia to be lit by oil lamps. Cannon-armed Russian warships stood out at sea while Russia got its first printed newspaper, Vea de Masti, with a circulation of between 200 and 4,000. Merchants' goods traveled from St. Petersburg to Moscow along newly dug canals. Advanced schools of artillery, medicine, and navigation were opened, and the Academy of Sciences established. In the Urals, nine foundries produced seven million pounds of cast iron a year and 200,000 pounds of copper. They supplied Russia's new armaments industry, turning out muskets and cannon for what was now one of the largest, most powerful armies in Europe. Peter had dragged Russia from the Middle Ages into the modern world. But his new state would now have to prove its resilience and weather the storm of dynastic crisis and intrigue. It would be 40 years before there was another Russian ruler to match Peter the Great.
the court of 18th century Imperial Russia was a place of etiquette and excess, stunning balls and carnivals, jesters and fireworks. The most popular dance was the quadrille, in which the dancers constantly changed their partners. Around these courtiers spun a huge Russian empire, its rulers coming and going like partners in the dance. This was Russia's age of palace revolutions. year 1727, two years after the death of Peter the Great. Peter had forged an empire through iron will and firm rule. Without him, it seemed to have lost its purpose. State revenue was collapsing. Ships stood unfinished in the shipyards. The army lacked vital equipment. Government bureaucracy was riddled with corruption. The Supreme Privy Council ruled the state. It consisted of a handful of nobles who chiefly looked after their own interests. And on the throne, a 12-year-old boy. Chapter 1, Peter II Alexeyevich. Peter II was the son of Prince Alexei and the German princess Sophie Charlotte of Brunswick-Luneburg, making him the grandson of Peter the Great. His mother died soon after childbirth, his father when he was just two. His older sister Natalia was his only close family. Peter seemed unlikely to inherit the throne, as Peter the Great had two other sons, Peter and Paul. But they both died in infancy, making Peter the last male of the Romanov dynastic line. Peter was born into an environment devoid of love or affection. His parents cared little for each other, while his father lived in terror of his grandfather, Peter the Great. Indifferent nursemaids gave him wine to stop him crying. His tutors were not much better. He was taught some German and Latin, but that was the extent of his learning. Even his Russian was bad. Nevertheless, by the age of seven, he was well acquainted with the lavish entertainments of court. <laughs> Young Peter wasn't interested in the army, the navy, or science, only in having fun. It didn't worry those around him. On the contrary, it served their interests. They wanted a czar they could control, a czar who was in their pocket. It was only a question of whose pocket he ended up in. When Peter II became emperor in 1727, he was immediately taken under the wing of His Serene Highness Alexander Danilovich Menshikov. He'd been a close friend and associate of Peter the Great and his widow, Empress Catherine I, and was the most influential man in Russia. Shortly before Catherine's death, Menshikov had persuaded the Empress to sign a will that made young Peter her heir. There was one condition. On coming of age, Peter was to marry Menshikov's daughter, Maria. Then Menshikov's control of the young Tsar would be total. Of course, no one asked for Peter's opinion on any of this. Soon after his coronation, the 12-year-old Peter found himself engaged to the 16-year-old Maria Menshikova. The Emperor's bride received the title Imperial Highness and an annual allowance of 34,000 rubles. Peter II found his fiancée deeply uninteresting. In his letters, he referred to her as the stone statue or the porcelain doll. Meanwhile, Menshikov moved the young Tsar into his own St. Petersburg palace to shield him from any unwanted external influence and assigned him a governor, Baron Andrei Ivanovich Osterman, 
Deputy Minister of Foreign Affairs. But the Emperor's studies didn't last long. Menshikov suddenly fell seriously ill, and in his absence, Peter fell in with a young rake, Ivan Dolgorukov, who encouraged him to flee Menshikov's stifling supervision. The Tsar quickly fell under the influence of Dolgorukov and his powerful family, who were bitter rivals of Menshikov. With their encouragement, he and his governor, Baron Osterman, moved out of Menshikov's palace and into the Peterhof palace. He also broke off his engagement to Maria Menshikova. Soon, a special commission found Menshikov guilty of embezzling state funds. He was stripped of all his titles, honors, estates, and property, and sent, with his family, into internal exile in Siberia. The Dalgarukovs, with the wily Baron Osterman, now held the reins of power. The sovereign, Tsar Peter, was free to indulge in his new favorite sport, hunting. Unlike his great-grandfather, Alexei I, who loved falconry, Peter II hunted without any expertise or knowledge. It didn't matter to him how or what he hunted. What mattered was riding fast and making a lot of noise. All this would have been entirely natural for his age if it hadn't been for his constant drinking sprees. Nobody cared about his health except his sister Natalia. She was the only person who truly loved the boy emperor and tried to stop him drinking. But aged just 14, she died of tuberculosis. With no one to stop him, Peter began regularly binge drinking with his guards. He was tall and well-developed for his age, and women were also made available to him. Peter then fell in love with his aunt, Elizabeth, daughter of Peter the Great. Nobody was going to let Peter marry Elizabeth. First of all, the church prohibited marriages between such close relatives. Second, Ivan Dolgorukov had already chosen a bride for him, his sister, Catherine. To sway the emperor's decision, Ivan provided proof that his aunt Elizabeth was already in love with an officer of the guards. The hot-headed teenager felt that Elizabeth had betrayed him and made a point of turning his attention to Catherine Dolgorukova. Once more, the Tsar found himself the pawn in other people's games. While the court was absorbed in imperial love matches, the vast Russian Empire was left virtually leaderless. State finances were in chaos. The army was disintegrating. Russia's international standing was in freefall. European ambassadors reported on the situation in Russia. It makes no sense to make an alliance at this time. The Tsar thinks only about his own amusement. His officials think only of how to ruin each other. Everybody lives without a care. It's unclear how such a vast state can maintain itself without any support. Russia's huge bureaucracy had been left to fend for itself because the body that was supposed to wield power in Russia had effectively ceased to function. The Supreme Privy Council had been established by Catherine I to help her rule the empire, or to be more exact, to rule it for her. Officially, it was only supposed to advise the monarch, but in reality, it was now governing Russia. During Peter II's reign, six nobles sat on the Supreme Council. Count Gavrila Golovkin, the Galitsins, Prince Dmitri and Prince Mikhail, the Dolgorukovs, Prince Vasily Vladimirovich and Vasily Lukic, and Baron Osterman. Peter, now 14 years old, 
had no idea about the problems his country faced, and the Dalgarukovs did everything to keep it that way. The father, Prince Alexei, using his son Ivan to keep Peter distracted. They intended to make the emperor their puppet and turn the clock back by undoing all Peter the Great's modernizing reforms. Peter had already agreed to stop new naval construction, persuaded it was a waste of money, and moved the capital from St. Petersburg back to Moscow, where the hunting was far superior. Only a few steps remained. In November 1728, the emperor's engagement to Ivan's sister, Princess Catherine Dolgorukova, was announced. As Catherine arrived at the palace for the official engagement, her carriage caught under a low gate. In front of guards and onlookers, the gilded crown on the carriage roof was torn off and fell into the gutter. In the weeks leading up to the wedding, the Dalgarukov princes kept the emperor constantly entertained, lest he have time to reconsider his decision. On January 6th, 13 days before the wedding, Peter went to the traditional blessing of the Moscow River. At the ceremony, he played the part of the chivalrous knight, standing on the footboard of Princess Catherine's carriage for hours in freezing weather. The next day, he had a burning fever. Then, he was diagnosed with smallpox. Smallpox, also known by its Latin name variola vera, had been present in Europe at a low level for a thousand years. But in the 18th century, higher population levels and the greater movement of people across the continent caused it to spread like wildfire. Smallpox victims developed spots on their face and limbs, and the rich, both men and women, wore heavy makeup to mask the scars they left. But it was more than just a cosmetic issue. Smallpox was a killer. In Europe, the virus infected more than half the population, about 80 million people, killing one in six. The emperor's health had been ruined by a dissolute lifestyle. His fever and weakened immune system allowed the smallpox to progress quickly. In just one week, it was clear Peter would not survive. The Dalgarukovs were in despair. It looked as if all their efforts had been in vain. Their grand schemes come to nothing. As the emperor lay dying, the Lefortov palace stood empty and silent, decorated for a wedding that would never take place. His Dalgarukov friends, meanwhile, were desperately looking for a way to cling to power. They decided to make the emperor sign a will, naming his betrothed, the Grand Duchess Catherine Dolgorukova, as his successor. If they had succeeded, the ruling House of Russia would have passed from the House of Romanov to the House of Dolgorukov. But the emperor was not able to sign the will. On January the 18th, 1730, the eve of his planned wedding, he suddenly sat up and ordered his sledge to be harnessed. I want to go and see my sister, he said. They were his last words. He died the next day. The Supreme Privy Council reacted with indignation to the idea of handing the throne to the Dolgorukovs. The Romanovs were the ruling dynasty of Russia. If the male line was broken, they would turn to the female line. The female line of the Romanovs lived on through the two daughters of Peter the Great, Anna and Elizabeth. There were also three daughters of Ivan V, Peter's half-brother and joint ruler, who died young. They were Catherine, Anna and Praskovia. Anna had married the Duke of Holstein. In 1728, she bore him a son, Karl Peter Ulrich. 
but she died soon after childbirth. Catherine had married the Duke of Mecklenburg and had a 12-year-old daughter, Elizabeth Katerina Christina. Anna was the widow of the Duke of Courland and had no children. Raskovia was married to General Dmitriev Mamonov. The council discussed the suitability of the candidates long into the night. Finally, at 6 a.m., they chose Anna, Duchess of Courland, and daughter of Ivan V. Widowed at the age of 17, she lived in Yelgava, near Riga. She had no money and no allies in Moscow. Blessed with neither great charm nor intellect, the council believed they could soon bend her to their will. To avoid any surprises, the council prepared a list of conditions, which Anna would have to sign before she took the throne. According to these conditions, the Empress would not have the right to declare war, make treaties, introduce new taxes, or spend state revenue make promotions above the rank of colonel, give out land, sentence nobles to death, get married, or appoint her successor. All these powers would reside in the Supreme Privy Council. The Empress would have control only over her own income and her palace guards. On the morning of January 19, 1730, the death of Peter II was announced publicly. At the same time, a delegation set off from Moscow to see Anna. Nine days later, she signed the conditions. Russian autocracy had been abolished. In its place, oligarchy, the rule of an elite few. Anna arrived in Moscow, where she was greeted by her guards, the Priabrzhensky Regiment. Anna declared that she was to be their chief and spoke privately with the officers. She learned many interesting things from these conversations. She was told the people of Moscow were outraged by the conditions that had been imposed upon her and that the Privy Council was despised by many of the nobles. Just days ago, Anna had been an impoverished, forgotten duchess in out-of-the-way Courland. Now she was within a stone's throw of becoming Empress of Russia. She sensed her moment. She gathered her guards and senior nobles in the palace hall and showed them what she thought of the conditions. Chapter 2. Anna Yanavna. Within a week, the Supreme Privy Council was dismissed. Within a month, Prince Alexei Dolgorukov and his son Ivan were exiled to the Siberian town of Berezov, where their sworn enemy Menshikov had died the year before. The day after becoming Empress, Anna demanded to see all the items confiscated from the famously wealthy Menshikov. She picked out jewelry for herself worth 23,000 rubles, 138 million today, about 4 million US dollars. She appointed a Russian architect of Italian parentage, Bartolomeo Restrelli, to build two new palaces for her, a wooden winter palace in the Kremlin and a stone summer palace on the Yauza River to help her settle in. Anna's German chamberlain, Ernst Biron, followed his mistress to Moscow. He was Anna's favorite and her lover. The fact that he was married with three children didn't concern her. Anna herself was the secret mother of his youngest son, Karl Ernst, which is why the boy was brought to Moscow. Later, they were joined by Biron's wife and elder sons. Together, they formed Russia's unorthodox new imperial family. The typical day for Empress Anna began at 8 a.m. when she took her coffee. She worked between 9 and 10, receiving ministers and signing decrees. Then she went riding with Biron. And at noon, she had lunch with him, his wife and children. Then she went to bed for an hour. The rest of the day was solely for her own amusement. 
Anna found many unusual ways to entertain herself. One of her favorite was shooting crows. This was why a loaded musket was left by each of the palace windows. The Empress didn't just shoot birds, she also hunted bears with a spear. But there were also more sophisticated entertainments at court, Italian operas and theater. In Anna's reign, the first Russian dance school was founded. But nothing delighted the Empress quite as much as watching her court jesters and dwarves fighting. Jesters first appeared in Russia in the reign of Ivan the Terrible. A century later, Alexei I liked to play chess against his own jester, an acrimonious hunchback named Balthazar. Peter the Great's jesters included a former officer of the Preobrazhensky regiment, Ivan Balakrev, who advised the Tsar on serious issues, and a Jew who'd converted to Christianity, Jan da Costa, who debated theology with the Tsar. The position of court jester flourished during the reign of Empress Anna. Now, there were more than ever. Balakrev and da Costa were joined by the Italian musician Pietro Pedrillo, a nobleman who'd been demoted to jesters, Prince Nikita Valkonsky, Prince Mikhail Galitsin, and Count Alexia Praxin. Her troupe of entertainers also featured ten dwarves, one Kalmuk woman and two Evenk women from Russia's easternmost regions. The Empress acquired a taste for exotic and spectacular parties, lavish banquets, masquerades and fireworks. The only thing she frowned on was drinking. Alcohol had caused the early death of her young husband, the Duke of Courland, after he had tried to keep pace with Peter the Great's drinking at their own wedding celebration. The Empress created a ministerial cabinet to handle the business of government. It was the Supreme Privy Council in all but name, just with new faces. Only the wily Baron Osterman kept his place, becoming the elder statesman of Anna's government. The Empress herself barely followed affairs of state. But Biron, who now held the title Duke of Courland, took an active role in cabinet business. One cabinet minister, Artemy Valinsky, wrote, The Empress is a fool. It's impossible to get any decision from her. Duke Biron does as he pleases. For opposing Biron, Belinsky was charged with treason and executed. The very thought of a palace revolution terrified Anna. She had Peter the Great's daughter Elizabeth watched to look for any hint of conspiracy. And she re-established the secret chancellery of investigations, founded by Peter but abolished by his successor. Its role was to sniff out any trace of political dissent. Its agents were everywhere and were rightly feared. Any careless word, particularly about the Empress, could lead to arrest and inevitably torture. In the course of Anna's 10-year reign, the secret chancellery arrested and tortured about 28,000 suspects. Of those, 20,000 were exiled to Siberia and Kamchatka. 5,000 went missing, 2,000 died during torture, and more than 1,000 were executed. The Empress was suspicious of her guards too, especially the Priabrzhensky regiment. They'd put her on the throne. They could depose her too. So she created a second guards regiment, Ismailovsky. The new regiment's officers were recruited from her native duchy of Courland and took over guard duty at the palace. The Priabrzhensky regiment was sent to fight the Turks. At Belgrade in 1739, a treaty was signed to end the four-year conflict between Russia and the Ottoman Empire. Under its terms, Azov and parts of Ukraine became part of Russia. But Russian warships and merchant ships were forbidden from sailing in the Sea of Azov or the Black Sea. The war cost the Russian army about 46,000 men. Only about 6,000, or one in eight of those men, fell in battle. 
the remaining 40,000 died from disease, starvation and neglect. Anna didn't concern herself with these details. She was glad the war was over, but her main concern was moving the court from Moscow back to St. Petersburg. In 1737, Moscow had been devastated by a great fire. The Kremlin, Kitegorad, the surrounding White Town, part of the Earth Town, almost all the modern city center was burnt to the ground. At the time, the great Tsar Bell had been standing in the Kremlin foundry. The scaffolding around it caught fire. When water was poured onto it, the bell burst from the sudden temperature change. Anna's winter palace also burnt down. But six months later, the Empress was celebrating her birthday in a new winter palace, built for her by Bartolomeo Rastrelli in St. Petersburg. The state apartments consisted of more than 100 rooms, all of them decorated in the most lavish style. Under Anna's reign, expenditure on the court reached 260,000 rubles per year, worth about $42 million today. The running costs of Duke Biron's stables were 100,000 rubles, about $17 million, while small-scale expenditures by the Empress totaled 42,500 rubles, or $7 million. Incredibly, the Empress spent as much on jewelry as it cost to maintain the Academy of Sciences, about 47,000 rubles, or $8 million. Just a tenth of that sum was spent on public education, a measly 4,500 rubles. Anna's most decadent celebration was held for the wedding of two of her court jesters in a palace of ice. On Anna's whim, the 53-year-old Mikhail Galitsin was to marry a 20-year-old Kalmuk girl named Avdotya Buzhenineva. The bill for the party came to 30,000 rubles. A house of ice, 17 meters long and 3 meters high, was built between the Admiralty and the Winter Palace. Six ice cannon and two mortars stood by the entrance. By the gates, there were ice sculptures of elephants and dolphins, while everything inside the house, even the furniture, was made of ice. Before the wedding, a masked procession passed through the city streets playing horns and balalaikas. It included representatives from across the empire, Ukrainians from the south and Nenets from the far north. Bride and groom traveled in a cage mounted on top of an elephant, and after the wedding were left in the bedroom of the ice palace. The French ambassador, Marquis de la Chetardie, was one of the guests. Only in this country is there such fun to be had the bride and groom were taken to an ice house. It was kept warm with straw. The light that shone in through the ice from all sides was extraordinary. All who saw it were amazed. One of the few not enjoying themselves was the Empress's beautiful cousin, Princess Elizabeth, now treated with open suspicion. Princess Elizabeth was adored by the guards. She was godmother to their children and lent some of them money. But most importantly, she was Peter the Great's daughter. Her popularity had become a threat to Anna's plans for the succession. Anna wanted the throne to remain with her father's line, that of Ivan V, half-brother and joint ruler with Peter the Great. So Anna announced that her heir would be the future son of her 14-year-old niece, Elizabeth Katerina Christina, even though at the time she wasn't even married. Elizabeth took the name Anna Leopoldovna after converting to orthodoxy, and at 20 married the Duke of Brunswick, Anton Ulrich, summoned to Russia for that purpose. Soon the couple had a son, Ion Antonovich, When the new heir to the Russian throne was just two months old, 
Empress Anna fell seriously ill with kidney stones. Inflammation and infection set in. Just two weeks after the first symptoms, on October 17, 1740, Anna died. One of her last acts was to sign a decree appointing a regent for the infant emperor, the Duke of Courland, Ernst Biron. The Russian people felt no great loss at the death of Empress Anna. Her reign would be remembered for excess, frivolity, and cruelty. Nevertheless, it was Anna who pushed forward the development of St. Petersburg. Many of its grandest and most famous buildings, including the Peter and Paul Cathedral, the Admiralty with its high spire, and the fountains of the Peterhof Palace were completed in the 1730s under the supervision of the Italian architects Rastrelli and Trezzini. Italian musical theatre made its first appearance in Russia, while the Academy of Sciences published a regular newspaper, the St. Petersburg News, as well as the first Russian scientific journals. Elsewhere, the foundations of Russian literature were being laid by poets such as Tretiakovsky and the young Lamonosov. The Empress herself, of course, was interested only in much cruder forms of entertainment. She had neither the intellect, energy, nor charisma to be an effective ruler, a position that, after all, came to her almost by chance. And within two weeks of her death, all the plans she had laid for her succession had collapsed like a house of cards. No one was satisfied by the appointment of Anna's lover, Ernst Biron, as regent to the infant emperor, Ivan VI. And so the guards intervened again. On the night of November 9, 1740, Field Marshal Count von Munich and 80 guardsmen burst into the Winter Palace. He sealed the exits and sent his adjutant to find Biron. According to the adjutant's report, Biron was sleeping soundly when they arrived. When he was awoken, he tried to hide under the bed, but the soldiers dragged him out. He struck out in an effort to break free, but the soldiers answered his blows with musket butts. He was then stripped naked, tied up, and carried to the guardhouse, where he was loaded into the field marshal's waiting carriage. He was carried out past the very rooms in which Anna's coffin was still lying. By 6 a.m., the palace coup was over. Russia had a new regent, the infant emperor's mother, the 21-year-old Anna Leopoldovna, rumored to be even less intelligent than her aunt, the late empress. Anna was madly in love with a Saxon diplomat named Count Leinar. Russian nobles feared they had another Biron on their hands when Leinar was given the post of Grand Chamberlain. He then briefly returned to Saxony to settle his affairs at home. But before he could return, the Russian throne changed hands once more. Peter the Great's daughter, Elizabeth, had finally made her move. Many people knew about the plot to put Elizabeth on the throne. Courtiers warned Anna about it every day. She paid little attention, until finally she decided to speak with Elizabeth herself. Elizabeth was her half-cousin once removed and 10 years her senior. Meeting warned Elizabeth that she was suspected. She had to act fast. She summoned a few trusted men donned a gilded breastplate over her parade uniform and went to the barracks of the Priobrzezinski regiment. Do you remember whose daughter I am? She cried. Are you ready to die for me? The guards responded with loud cheers. Elizabeth led them to the Winter Palace, where the guards also quickly switched their allegiance. She entered the bedroom of Anna Leopoldovna with the words, Sister, it's time to get up. Then she went to the nursery of the infant Emperor Ivan. 
she ordered her men not to wake him. She took Ivan in her arms, kissed him, and said, You're not to blame, little one. Nobody knew what to do with him. Elizabeth left the Winter Palace with the child in her arms. Chapter 3 Elizabeth Petrovna The little Ivan VI became Russia's man in the Iron Mask. Almost all his short, tragic life was spent in closely guarded confinement. First in Rannenburg, then in Kalmogori, and then in solitary confinement in the Schlüsselburg Fortress, where he was held as a prisoner with no name. Ivan spent seven years in a cell with no natural light, with only the Bible to read. At the age of 24, he was murdered by his guards during a failed rescue attempt. His parents spent the rest of their lives under guard in Kolmogori, far to the north, so that no one was ever tempted to restore their family to the throne. In the aftermath of the palace revolution, Ivan VI's fate was not yet known. Elizabeth had many important decisions to make. First, she announced that she would restore the laws and state bodies established by her father, Peter the Great. The Senate resumed its work as a legislative and judicial body. The ministerial cabinet was dismissed. Elizabeth would learn to keep a close eye on all her advisers, to ensure none grew too powerful or dared challenge her authority. During her magnificent coronation, Elizabeth became the first Russian monarch to place the crown upon her own head, a moment rich in symbolism. Foreigners who'd helped Elizabeth gain power, hoping for special treatment, were disappointed. The new empress wasn't going to dance to anyone else's tune. On one occasion, her agents intercepted a letter sent by her old friend, the French ambassador, Marquis de Chetardy. The smallest matters terrify her. Weakness and instability. This is the essence of all the Tsaritsa's actions. Marquis was sent home within 24 hours. The Empress never forgot who'd really put her in power. The guards. Now she entrusted her life to them, creating a special unit to act as her bodyguard. The Leap Company was an elite unit made up of the 300 grenadiers and 64 officers that had put Elizabeth on the throne. These men could do virtually whatever they liked, and made for terrible guards, often drinking on duty, falling asleep, and even leaving their posts. But the Empress excused them anything. She herself was the unit's commanding officer. Its officers were her friends and closest allies, including the brothers Peter and Alexander Shuvalov and her lover, Alexei Razumovsky. Alexei Razumovsky held no political rank at all, but if he'd wanted, he could have become the most influential man in Russia. Wielding power did not interest him. He was good-natured and entirely without ambition. The Empress's happiness was his only concern. The son of a Cossack farmer from northern Ukraine, he had a fine singing voice and was extremely handsome. He became Elizabeth's constant companion. He was cheerful, calm and dependable, and they were devoted to each other. Rzymowski gave Elizabeth a taste for Ukrainian cuisine, and her cooks prepared borscht with garlic and dumplings for her almost every day. The Empress liked to eat well and had certain peculiar habits. For example, she always had a radish with a glass of vodka, ate something fatty late at night, and drank a lot of coffee. Her personal coffee maker, Carl Sievers, was obliged to follow her everywhere to make coffee for her. The Empress adored sweet things too. Confectioners were hired from France and Italy to create fantastic sculptures from sugar and sponge. 
Like her mother, Catherine I, Elizabeth was a night owl and stayed up long after the balls had finished. And there was always the lingering fear of a nighttime palace coup. Elizabeth never slept in the same room twice, and her apartments were constantly being altered. New doors and windows were cut through the walls, staircases were moved, all measures to create new escape routes and to confuse any potential conspirators. This deep fear was masked by a busy schedule of court entertainments. On Mondays, music for dancing. On Wednesdays, Italian music. On Tuesdays and Fridays, theater. Elizabeth loved balls and masquerades and could happily dance through the night. She liked to devise her own magical or comical themes. For instance, making all the men come dressed as women and the women as men. All the guests would be made to look ridiculous except Elizabeth herself, whose shapely legs were universally admired. The Empress was a great beauty, but hugely vain. Her courtiers were expected to pay her endless compliments, while ladies feared to dress too well in case they were thought to be competing with her. To ensure she was always the most magnificently attired, Elizabeth would issue strict rules before a ball stipulating certain colors or hairstyles that only she was permitted to wear. The Empress's wardrobe was reported to include no fewer than 15,000 dresses. She never wore a dress twice and sometimes changed several times in a single evening. Merchants importing expensive textiles from abroad were obliged to bring them to the Empress first so she could select the finest fabrics for herself. Rococo style was the latest fashion in Europe, which meant frilly shirts for the men and for the women, whalebone corsets to create tiny waists and huge skirts supported by cane hoop petticoats. Fantastically elaborate hairdos were all the rage, some of them 60 centimeters high and shaped to resemble fancy hats, flower beds or even ships and windmills. Small flasks of water holding live flowers were sometimes tied into the hair. At night, it was recommended to cover such constructions with a nightcap to prevent lice from crawling in. Empress Elizabeth also demanded palaces to equal anything in Austria or France. This is where the genius of Bartolomeo Rastrelli came in. The son of a famous Italian sculptor, Rastrelli moved to St. Petersburg as a teenager, and his work soon found favor with the Empress Anna. As senior court architect, he was kept on by Elizabeth, and his projects became yet more daring and grand. His designs included the new Winter Palace, Smolny Cathedral, Grand Peterhof Palace, and the Zaskiesello Palace. The cost was astronomical. The palace at Zaskiesello alone cost 1.6 million rubles, the equivalent of about $270 million today. This at a time when the Russian economy was crippled by corruption and a currency crisis. Russians, uncertain of the future, had begun to hoard more and more currency. Every year the state increased coin production, but they simply vanished into the economy. There were approximately 54 million coins in circulation, but none of them were circulating. Many industries, such as the extremely lucrative salt trade, were state-sanctioned monopolies run by influential officials and friends of the Empress, like Peter Shuvalov. Corruption had reached extraordinary levels. Almost all of Elizabeth's ministers also received wages from foreign countries. Those taking payments from foreign governments included the Chancellor, Alexei bastuzhev ryumin and the Vice-Chancellor, Mikhail Vorontsov. 
It was once said of Vorontsov that he was on sale to the first bidder. The Empress needed foreign money too. Word spread that she was willing to sign conventions for subsidies. In these unequal agreements, Russia agreed to enter a war on one side or another in exchange for cash payments. Russia had become, in effect, a state for hire. One thing Elizabeth refused to sign was any death warrant. When she came to power, she'd sworn that she'd have no one executed and was true to her word. An entire generation of noblemen grew up without fear of the scaffold. Slowly but surely, the Russian economy began to modernize. The first banks opened, offering loans at 6% per annum. Industry was expanding rapidly. Russia was producing 2 million poods, or 33,000 tons, of cast iron a year, half of which was sold overseas. The Russian population was rising, 5 million in a quarter of a century. As she aged, Elizabeth became increasingly worried about losing her looks. She sought reassurance in the arms of a court page, 18 years her junior, named Ivan Shuvalov. Her infatuation with this handsome youth soon turned to love. Her former favorite, Razumovsky, quickly understood. Without scandal or acrimony, quietly withdrew from court. The new favorite was much like the old, calm, gentle, and good-natured, and absolutely loyal to the Empress. He asked for neither money nor positions. However, unlike Razumovsky, Shuvalov was highly educated. He corresponded with the French philosopher Helvetius and was passionate about improving the state of Russian education. Thanks to his influence, Elizabeth authorized the founding of the Russian Academy of Arts and Moscow University. But the life of the Merry Empress was not all balls and parties. She had another passion, foreign policy. In the 1740s, the warlike King Frederick of Prussia was seeking to expand his realm at the expense of his neighbors and to establish Prussia as a great power. Most of the other European powers were determined to stop him and formed themselves into an alliance. The driving forces behind the alliance were Maria Theresa, Empress of Austria, Elizabeth, Empress of Russia, and Madame Pompadour, mistress of the King of France. Frederick, famous for his low opinion of women, was nevertheless an intellectual and a wit, who nicknamed the alliance against him the League of the Three Petticoats. The three women had led their countries into one of the greatest conflicts in European history, the Seven Years' War. Russia joined the fray in 1757, launching an attack on East Prussia. After meeting the Russian army in battle, Frederick declared, to stop a Russian soldier, you need two bullets, one to kill him, another to bring him down. Following a decisive victory against the Prussian army at Kunersdorf, Russian forces took control of Eastern Prussia. The following year, 1760, Russian troops briefly occupied Frederick's capital, Berlin. The war seemed to be virtually won. But suddenly, inexplicably, military operations were called to a halt. On Christmas Eve, 1761, Elizabeth had a sudden sensation that she was dying. All her life, the word death had terrified her. But now, she was perfectly calm. She made her confession, took communion, and bid farewell to relatives and friends. She gave her last advice to her heir, Peter Fyodorovich, and his wife, Catherine, be friends. On Christmas Day, she died. Elizabeth was laid in her coffin wearing a silver dress with lace sleeves, a golden crown on her head, 
beautiful and serene as she had been in her youth. But those at the funeral were fixated instead on the strange behavior of the new emperor, Peter III. He either walked too slowly or ran, laughed or grimaced. It was whispered that he'd already ordered Russian troops out of Prussia and offered his idol, King Frederick, peace with no demands. It didn't seem to matter to him that thousands of Russian soldiers would have died in vain. There were soon doubts about the new emperor's sanity and what he might do. One thing seemed certain, the endless parties, the glamour and frivolity of Elizabeth's court were a thing of the past. But some already looked to Peter III's young wife, Catherine, and wondered if that glorious age could not be reclaimed.